السادة الحضور السلام Ladies and gentlemen, peace be upon you all. We would like to welcome you in the proceedings of the second day of the annual energy conference organized by the ECSSR. And we will start the proceedings of this day by the third session under the title of the Exploration, Production, and Development of Unconventional Fuels, Factors, and Trajectories. One year ago, the coal was the only source for energy. And in the middle of the last years, we started to change the game. And before the end of the last century, we started to use the LNG and the title and this is this changed the game rules are we going to see another change for the rules of the game with the new comer the shale gas is it a real revolution or just a bubble do you think that the shale gas is going to change the trend of exportation and importation and the US is going to be the exporter of energy after being an importer for centuries and decades. There are any real assessments reflecting the real bubble or it's a change for the businessmen in Wall Street? Uh, Dr. Professor Young Kyu Kim will take us uh, in a round uh, with the shale gas answering these questions and others. Dr. and Professor Kim is the director of the Center for Energy Governance and Security and Associate Professor of International Studies in Hanyang University, Republic of Korea. Professor Kim participated and uh, wrote uh, almost 35 uh, academic studies and uh, wrote four books. And he is a specialist uh, and a researcher in the security of uh, energy and in the security and economy. Dr. Kim, please proceed. Uh, thank you for having me for this Im important conference. Uh, I was asked to uh, discuss, uh, provide an overview of global trends and prospects for shale gas. Let me start my timer here. Uh, you know, the global uh, shale gas trends today, in discussing global shale gas trends, the, the big question is, you know, how much the impact of potential U.S. shale gas exports and then what kind of impact will that have on the global LNG market? And I think uh, I chose three big questions here. Number one, in discussing this, I think we need, we need to first discuss, you know, domestic supply demand, uh, you know, move and price, uh, pricing debate in the United States first. Then I think uh, second, uh, the current consumption of uh, Chinese uh, natural gas, which is 100 by 2020, that 100 consumption will increase to 400. So where and how China is going to secure that increase, that, ha that will have a huge impact. So I'm going to discuss that, you know, uh, how much shale gas will help China cover that gap, or LNG imports, or PNG imports, we need to discuss that. And thirdly, uh, you know, with potential U.S. shale gas exports on the horizon, uh, what kind of impact, what kind of price impact, what kind of geopolitical impact? And the East Asia, particularly China, Japan, Korea, uh, they, are, they are big consumers. 
a huge lucrative market. So what kind of impact potential U.S. trade gets exports, particularly on this lucrative market, China, Japan, Korea? And you need to uh, look at what, what's going to happen in that market, right? So now let's begin first. Okay. Now, we have a, a sharp division in the discussion on the current state of the U.S. shale gas, uh, particularly those scholars like Arthur Berman and David Hughes. Uh, they are opponents of U.S. shale gas development. Let's heed what they claim. What they claim is first, U.S. shale gas gold rush may be, may be ending because current production appears to be in decline or in plateau, which is a big statement, right? I mean, demand will be uh, outpacing supply, right? Uh, so that shale gas will meet supply expectations, but at much higher prices, right? At what price, how much is, is, is the United States going to produce natural gas? That's, that's the question here. And more liquid-prone drilling will decrease gas supply over time. That's another argument. And shale gas, uh, you know, shale gas extraction by nature uh, requires uh, continuous and uh, extensive and prolific drilling. So that, you know, hence the drilling a treadmill, you know, you, more and more uh, wells and capital are needed to simply offset the decline. But even if more new wells are added, shale gas decline is inevitable. So here, despite operator claims of increasing efficiency here, more wells are required to replace the same gas volume every year. So decline rates are higher than expected. Why don't we look at uh, some of the uh, evidence by shale play by shale play, how this works, whether or not this is, is, is proved. Uh, you know, Haynesville shale play and Eagle Ford Barnett, these were major players in supplying you know, unconventional natural gas to the United States, particularly Haynesville, 8 mmcf, Eagle Ford, 2 mmcf, Barnett represents 9%, Fayetteville, 4%, Bakken is in insignificant. Uh, skip this a little bit. Here. The lady, Deborah Rogers, who is outstanding in terms of uh, giving out that uh, skeptical opinion on U.S. shale gas development here. You know, the blue, everywhere you see blue is a copy of wells. You know, wells drilled everywhere here. But you see the red one, everywhere you see red is a well that made money. Red ones are only profitable ones. So only one well out of 10 makes money. So the question here, uh, is this business model of U.S. shale gas sustainable? Uh, you know, is this, from the long-term perspective, how su sustainable is this? That's the question. Let's look at some of the statistics here. This is a list of uh, unconventional play rankings in terms of recoverable reserves. Marcellus, obviously top, about 200 TCF. Haynesville comes next, Eagle Ford, Barnett. Unconventional oil play, Bakken, obviously, the huge one. The, the active wells, about seven, seven billion barrels per day. Eagle Ford, then Permian. Now, 
let's look at how uh, the economics, the foggy economics of shale gas production works here. Haynesville, this is Haynesville. You see, if you look at this, clearly uh, current production appears to be in decline. And there are more new wells I added yearly, but still, uh, this is reality. There is a sharp uh, decline rate here, right? In, this, in the space of just three years, right? So that decline rate, 48% annual base decline rate. Barnett, smaller, 29% annual base decline rate. Now, the emerging new shale plates, uh, Marcellus here, let's look at that. These are you know, the companies that are working in this Marcellus area. Uh, currently about seven, seven to eight BCFD. And by 2020, we're looking at maybe 14 BCFD. The recounts, here is the recount uh, move here. Okay, mostly West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Southwest Pennsylvania, North, Northeast Pennsylvania here. Recount about uh, currently, at the end of 2012, about 100. Which is a recount decrease here. Although recount is not directly correlated production. Okay, there, there's a lot of discussion about that nowadays. And overall, in the entire uh, United States, about 1,800 you know, reeks. So out of that, in the Marcellus area, 100. Economic analysis, which is interesting. You know, there, there are a lot of debates about break-even prices. How much does a shale gas, shale gas well cost? This is the debate going on in the United States, the big debate there. And if you look at you know, this area, Marcellus, different companies have different break-even prices, you know, down to companies like Breitling, you know, 2.24 break-even price. Bakken. Uh, very interesting area, mostly, mostly shale oil, uh, currently about uh, 900,000 barrels of oil. We expect by 2020, 1.2 million barrels of oil, and these are the companies that are working in this region. Hydrocarbon type, Bakken, as you can see from here, mostly crude oil, and some NGL, and natural gas, very much small. Bakken rigs, at the end of 2012, about 160, 170, down from you know, 2011, right? Economic analysis, uh, this is how much the U.S. can produce oil from Bakken, the Bakken area. Uh, around 45, 50, a little bit more than uh, 45, they think of uh, middle of 60 is the ceiling. Hydrocarbon type, Permian, mostly oil again. So Permian, Bakken, these are most active areas nowadays. Recount, at the end of 2012, a lot, right? 250. Altogether, 1,800 currently in the United States. And uh, producing wells in the United States, overall, uh, 180,000 wells. Economic analysis here, even lower, mid-30s. Eagle Ford, half crude oil, half natural gas. Marcellus, mostly dry gas. Right? So this, this shows oil and gas companies after uh, you know, natural gas prices plunged, plummeted, uh, oil and gas companies, they turned from dry gas production right, to maintain profitability to so-called liquid rich you know, plates like Eagle Ford and Permian. Recounts, less than 180. Eagle Ford valuation, again, mid 30s, right? So, if you combine all that by 2020, crude oil production uh, forecast, 
about by 2025 million barrels per day. I don't know what kind of impact it is going to have on the, you know, uh, the oil market. Uh, Dr. Al Haji discussed that yesterday. Uh, closing comments. Uh, Again, you know, good things about U.S. shale gas prospects, you know, we know all about that. I mean, the U.S. is on its way to surpass Saudi by 2017. Then 65 oil is really the number that U.S. needs, you know, to sustain. And despite all these shale gas uh, skeptics, continued consoli consolidation is probable because new shale basins will be added, new wells added. Uh, is this uh, going to be replicated in China? There was a huge debate yesterday also. I was in Shanghai uh, last week. Again, very interesting, but, but uh, the bottom line is, the last paragraph here, China's target of 6.5 billion cubic meter, way overstatement by 2015. The currently, uh, the amount China is producing, shale gas China is producing is 0 0.015 PCM, right? They're performing uh, way underperforming to their expectations. Uh, what does that mean? Wh what that means is that, you know, here is the, some of the statistics. Uh, again, we had that discussion yesterday, you know, uh, 20 years away from uh, commercial production, maybe. Then currently China is uh, drilling, uh, there are different statistics. Again, yesterday there were numbers like uh, 150, but the number I have is 53 or 55 wells. China is drilling actually. So to get that you know, level, 6.5 BCM, how many wells you need to drill? You need to drill 1,800 wells. Right? That's the target, 1,800 wells. And that, you know, American um, cost of uh, drilling one well, okay, it depends on shale place, but two point, between two to three million dollars. And Chinese cost, maybe 16, up to 60 million dollars per well. So if you include all that, to drill 1,800 wells, you need probably around $20 billion, okay? Now, that's that. What kind of impact uh, is, you know, potential U.S. shale gas export and shale revolution is going to have on global natural gas market. Let me show you this sort of uh, some of the interesting uh, arrows and all that. This is what happened before shale gas revolution occurred. Canada exporting, you know, to the United States, Europe, from Africa, from Middle East, from Russia. The biggest flow actually is from Russia. Then Northeast Asian region, mostly uh, from the Middle East, right? We are a good market for you. Then Southeast Asia. And uh, right before shale gas revolution occurred, we were discussing some LNG from Russia. That's what was happening right before shale gas revolution occurred. Then shale gas revolution occurred. This is what happened. What might happen, theoretically. Some arrows are, right? widening, some arrows are decreasing. The big question, what changed after this big arrow from the North American area? There are two scenarios uh, in terms of how much America can export to uh, you know, the a Asia Pacific market. Two scenarios, one is six, uh, 12 BCFD. Henry Hill price may be four to five dollars, and environmental regulation must be low under that scenario. So 12 BCFD, around 95 MTPA, which is, a, which is a lot of natural gas. And this amount, if America were to export this amount under that price, I think 
America can have some handle on some price, natural gas price, global natural gas price, some impact, some impact, particularly in the Asia Pacific market. Second scenario, would be 6 PCF to, to Asia, 6 PCF to Europe. Second scenario, Henry Hub, maybe 6 to 8, and the amount, 6 PCFD, and 48 MTPA. And this amount, much more realistic, although the domestic dynamics, which I discussed, all the economics and cost debate, uh, has a huge question even about this, but uh, put that aside, put, put that, you know, cost debate aside, if America can uh, realize this much export, then the impact of this much on the price, global natural gas price, should be minimal, should be minimal. Okay, I have two minutes. Then, uh, what impact on uh, global natural gas market, and particularly lucrative uh, China, Japan, Korea natural gas market, LNG market? This is, this is a very interesting debate. Lots of articles and reports about this. Um, you know, the big trend here is that uh, there's a huge movement toward uh, uh, LNG increase, right, like this. Over the last five years, we had 52% increase in the LNG, uh, LNG market. The largest exporter, Qatar, 75 million ton. Importer, CJK, China, Japan, Korea, they're the big markets, okay? Very important market. And LNG market is moving away from long-term contract toward spot markets. Market is being much more flexible. Okay, hence the price mechanism is also changing. There's a huge spot market share increase, like this. Right, globally about one TCM LNG being traded. Okay, LNG only thirty percent, still PNG seventy percent. Biggest import: Japan, Korea, UK, you know, all this, right? Now, import in the, in the Asia Pacific market, Japan, South Korea, China, okay? But what's behind this, what, what's hiding behind this is that year on year increase, China, India, okay? We need to, we need to pay attention to this. Uh, again, you know, Australian, uh, Analysts visited uh, China and they looked around uh, what's going on regarding Chinese shale gas experimentation. And they reached uh, some conclusion that it'll take some time. They went back and Australians were preparing to expand their LNG projects, okay? Because here, the original plan of the Chinese government was shale gas, maybe 10 BCM by 2020, okay? But if that fizzles out, then LNG import should be replacing the shale gas portion, right? So Australia is looking at this very much uh, with, with a lot of caution, okay? Um, PNG structure in, in the Asia Pacific market is insufficient, okay? We are still relying on LNG portion. Now, uh, in conclusion, you know, I debated three different things, but uh, what's behind all this, th these are all connected. U.S. market, Chinese shale gas, Asia Pacific LNG market, these are all connected, okay? U.S. supply uh, must be maintained, okay? In order for U.S. supply to be maintained, to be on the market, I think it is imperative that U.S. shale must be examined uh, in a much more thoroughly and independent way so that everything is done in a transparent manner. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Kim. Since the discovery of the shale gas and its dissemination in the United States of America, it is, guess, it is getting all the interest from the media outlets, research institutes, power companies, when it comes to the unconventional fossil fuels. But uh, is it alone in this endeavor, or there are other resources of fossil fuels, unconventional fossil fuels? What are these resources, and what is its role, and what is its true volume, and how will it affect the international markets, and will it uh, draw the uh, power uh, map during the next few years, or the technological or environmental, and perhaps the political factors uh, will have something else to say? Dr. Stevenson. Michael Stevenson will answer these uh, questions and will discuss them through his own paper entitled Unconventional uh, Fossil Fuels. Dr. Stevenson is the director of science and technology at the British Geological Survey. He is at the same time Vice President of the Nottingham Center for uh, the uh, Carbon. Dr. Stevenson oversees uh, the science program at the Geological Survey, where more than 500 experts are working with him in different scientific uh, main fields, which include the hydrocarbons, the geological threats, and the climate change. He has uh, a PhD at, uh, from uh, Nottingham. He has also other degrees from Imperial College and from Sheffield uh, University at, as well. He is one of the best to talk about this uh, issue, non-shale unconventional fuels. He is known for speaking about uh, the energy sector. He has lectured uh, um, and participated in a number of studies, governmental and private studies, especially to study the layers of the earth. He has published more than 70 articles in his name about this subject. At the same time, he works as a member amidst, uh, uh, in a number of scientific uh, journals. Professor Michael, Michael Stevenson, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the welcome I've received here, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I was asked to speak about unconventional fuels, uh, not including shale gas, and my talk will be uh, um, much more geological than Professor Kim's, uh, so really focusing on the geology and prospects and potential for unconventional fuels which are not shale gas. Just a few words about the British Geological Survey. We are Britain's um, Geological Research Institute. We include about 700 people, about 550 scientists working across geology, physics, and chemistry. Um, so in my talk, I will just briefly touch on the difference between conventional and unconventional. Then I will go into five unconventional fuels. I realize there are probably more than this, but these are the five that I've chosen to look at. Um, and then I will try to bring together some thoughts about those different unconventional fuels. So what are the limitations on their use, for example? So first of all, conventional and unconventional. These two words are 
They have various meanings. Uh, for example, if you go on the Schlumberger website and look up the word unconventional, it, it says fossil fuels produced in a non-conventional way, which is not very helpful. But essentially, it means uh, producing fossil fuels in a way which is not the way that we're used to doing. Uh, in, to some geologists, it means producing fossil fuels from a very impermeable rock. To others, it means fossil fuels which are not like the fossil fuels we're used to. So a conventional fossil fuel, oil and gas, might come from a sandstone or a carbonate. And you can see in the picture some sandstone and those yellow grains of sandstone and the green space between is where oil and gas might exist. So that's a conventional, simple conventional reservoir. Shale is an unconventional reservoir. It's very impermeable. It has very small spaces between the particles. And you can see in the picture how different it is. The particles are very squashed. The spaces between are very small. In oil sands, which I'll talk about, uh, the reservoir is generally unconsolidated. So the sands are not sandstone, but actually uh, broken and friable grains of sand with oil in between. So I'll look at that in detail in a moment. In methane hydrates, and we had a very detailed talk about methane hydrates yesterday, uh, methane and other molecules are trapped inside essentially crystals of ice and you can see a picture of that there. In underground coal gasification, unconventional really means the different way that you extract the energy from the coal. So it's not to do with porosity or permeability, it's to do with the fact that in underground coal gasification, you're taking energy from coal in a way that we're not used to taking energy from coal. In coal bed methane, it's unconventional, again, because we're taking methane from coal in an unconventional way. And one fuel which is unconventional, which probably most of you have not heard of, which could be important, and I, I'm saving this one till last because I think it will interest you, is hydrogen from rocks. And there may be some real potential in this part of uh, the Arabian Peninsula for this kind of unconventional fuel, hydrogen. So that is an introduction to conventional and unconventional. Last week, I spent uh, a week in Alberta and Texas, and I was lucky enough to fly over the uh, Athabasca tar sands in a small plane. And I, I was doing that on Thursday last week which explains why I look so tired, because I've been all over the world in the last uh, few days. But flying over the Athabasca tar sands is an amazing experience, because basically what you see is a tremendous wasteland of uh, trees which have been removed and simply huge pits and holes where uh, rock, which is mixed with bitumen and tar, is completely exposed to the atmosphere. You can see it on the left there. And what it's brought home to me, uh, coming from a country which really prizes green and beautiful countryside, like on the right, is the tension between the resource and the environment. And this is a the theme of my talk. Resource is clear and unconventional fuels are a resource but they have implications for the environment, some more than others. Oil sands have a very strong implication for the environment because basically you destroy it for a short time while you exploit the, the tar and the oil sands. So some of these tensions include contamination of water, also using a lot of water which could be used for other things like people and agriculture, air and noise pollution, and the appearance of the land, although this may seem less important, it's important to you if you live there. The appearance of your landscape, your, the place where you live, you don't want to have it destroyed. 
So there's a big tension between resource and environment, and this is a the theme of my talk. So I'm going to go through these different unconventional fuels now. First of all, oil sands. So this is a photo of the Athabasca oil sands. This is the world's largest single petroleum accumulation. Uh, it's the biggest beyond any other accumulation of oil on Earth. And it's different because the oil is very thick and it sits in unconsolidated sand of lower Cretaceous age. It's not hard sand, it's simply soft. And if you pick it up, it looks like that. It's horrible, black, you can, you know, mush it up with your fingers. And it's full of bitumen, so heavy oil. Of course, I don't need to tell you what heavy oil is, but essentially this stuff will not flow. So it's quite difficult to exploit. And of course, for a very long time, Canada knew they had these oil sands, but they couldn't think of a way to exploit them. And this is what they look like. So essentially, the oil sands are grains of sand in which oil has permeated, into which oil has flowed. It's very important to realize that the oil sands in Alberta are hygroscopic. So the sand grains are covered with a thin layer of water, which makes the oil much easier to take out because the oil doesn't stick to the sand grains so much. So other oil sands in the world, like in Utah, for example, in the United States, they don't have a hygroscopic or a layer of water, so it's harder to get the oil out. But even then, it was difficult to get the oil out. Why is it bitumen and not pure oil? Why is it only heavy oil? Well, a lot of research has gone into this, and one of the conclusions is that the oil has been degraded by modern bacteria. So it's been degraded in the surface layers of the earth so that the lighter fractions of oil have been removed and only heavy oil or bitumen exists between the particles, which makes it rather different from oil in this region, for example. So how do they get the oil out of the oil sands? Well, originally it was mined in the same way that any mineral would be mined. So essentially they dug up the sand and they heated it up and melted the oil out and sold the oil. But recently, most of the surface accumulations have been mined out, and so the subsurface oil sands are now being exploited. And they have invented a method called SAGD, or Steam Assisted Gravity Drainage. And you can see in the picture how this works, it's relatively simple. The subsurface oil sand is heated by, a uh, by an injector well, so you inject it with steam, it heats up the oil around, and the oil permeates into the producer well, and it's pumped out. What happens is that areas of uh, production are isolated in un uh, unexploited oil sand so that uh, groundwater does not come in into contact with the melted or the exploited part because groundwater which freely moves in this area could easily get into the rivers and carry away some of the contaminants of this heavy oil. They also use things like solvents to move the oil. So this is the way that they protect the environment by trying to exploit only discrete parts of the oil sands that leave other parts unexploited. So that's called SAG-D, and it's really increasing the production of oil in that area. So as I said, there is a tension between resource and environment. And for each of these unconventional fuels, I will look at this tension. So this is for oil sands. On the left, you can see the size of the resource. So as I said, the Athabasca oil sands are the world's largest single petroleum accumulation. 
Total natural bitumen are estimated at 249 billion barrels, and that's globally, of which 176 billion barrels, or 70%, are in Canada alone. So can Canada appears to have most of these oil sands. There are other, other, other places in the world, Kazakhstan, Utah, and the United States also have them. The environment side, water usage, huge amounts of water is, are used in SAGD, for example. When you produce the oil and the gas, you obviously produce atmospheric emissions, so CO2 emissions. Local air quality can be bad because of the amount of energy used in the extraction. You use a lot of land as well. You saw the picture before. You destroy large areas of land. And it's possible to contaminate groundwater as well. So these all have to be very carefully managed. So there's a big tension between resource and environment in the oil sands. Let's move on to the next unconventional fuel. So underground coal gasification. For those of you who have not heard of this technology, it's simple. It's that you exploit coal without mining it. So essentially, you burn the coal underground. You don't take it to the surface. You oxidize it below the surface, in situ, in the coal seam. And then you e extract the gas produced. So the picture shows you, on the left, an injection well, where you inject O2, or oxygen, air, and water into the coal seam, which can be very deep. It means you can exploit a coal seam which is too deep to mine, essentially. And the production well allows CO2, H2, CH4 to come out, essentially a mixture which is usually called syngas. So that gas that you can take out can be used to generate electricity. So underground coal gasification has been thought of a way of generating electricity and gener using generating syngas in areas where coal is too deep to mine. And an example of where it could be done is in the United Kingdom. So in Britain, we, the Geological Survey, did a report in 2004 looking in great detail at areas where underground coal gasification might be possible. And this is the South Wales coal field. Uh, it's an area around uh, 100 kilometers across. And the dark red areas are areas which could have underground coal gasification potential. So that's based on depth, distance from aquifers, and lots of other characteristics. So you can see the two dots here are areas where we could do UCG in the United Kingdom. We don't do it. But this has potential. The resource and environment for UCG, again, there is a big tension because UCG looks like a big resource. The World Energy Council said that UCG will increase economically recoverable coal reserves by 600 billion tons. So it makes much more coal available than is available by conventional mining. Uh, and UK has. 7 billion tons of coal which are suitable for UCG. That's a lot more than we have for conventional mining. So it's 289 years worth of coal based at UK coal consumption. So it would increase British coal by a lot, but it has many environmental problems. Amongst them, what the public thinks of it. So First of all, atmospheric emissions have produced gas because it's a fossil fuel, potential for subsidence, and pollution migration away from the cavity. So creating a cavity of burning coal may produce pollu pollutants which would get into, into the subsurface. So that is a big tension. You, you have the resource, but you also have the environment that puts the brakes on using that resource. The third one, coal bed methane. Coal bed methane is essentially, instead of mining coal, you extract methane from the coal. So methane is commonly present in coal, in the cleats, uh, and adsorbed onto the surface of the organic matter in coal. And again, you can drill holes into the coal, or boreholes, and follow the coal seams and extract methane from the coal. 
Uh, and again, it, it's something which has potential all over the world. It's uh, quite strongly developed in Australia, for example. It's been thought about in India. Uh, in the, U the UK, we have a few small uh, uh, ideas to do it. So uh, the re again, for coal bed methane, there is a tension between resource and environment. First of all, for example, in Australia, coal bed methane uh, from Queensland and New South Wales produces about 10% of Australia's gas production. So Australian reserves were estimated at 300, sorry, 33 trillion cubic feet of January 2012. So it's, it's quite a big resource. You notice I'm not giving world resources for most of these. It's because they're not really available or not really reliable because of the uncertainties over production. The environment, again, atmospheric emissions of the gas, because if you burn coal, obviously, or burn methane, you produce CO2. One big problem with coal bed methane is produced water, because you have to often drain water out of the coal seam for as much as a year before you can get any gas out. And there are possible interactions with aqu aquifers again. Methane hydrate is the fourth one. And you probably notice I'm going further and further from the more established to the less established uh, unconventional fuels here. So we had a very good talk yesterday about methane hydrates. I don't want to go into great detail, but essentially methane hydrates are methane molecules trapped in ice. It can happen at the, in the terrestrial parts on land, but it, it is most, most common in the subsea, in the deep subsea, in the sediments at, at the seabed. And this is what it looks like in uh, scanning electron microscope. The dark areas are methane hydrates, and the lighter areas are grains of, of sand in a sandstone, an unconsolidated sandstone. I don't want to bore you with graphs, but it's, it's very simple. Uh, Essentially, methane hydrates only occur in deep water, in sediments under very deep water, and, and or in cold climates. Uh, and uh, very detailed modeling like this of the stability of methane hydrates has enabled, for example, in the United Kingdom, us to be able to uh, model where we think a lot of methane hydrates might be. And this is Scotland here, and you see the top of Scotland, and you can see those contour lines, and what they show are thicknesses of predicted methane hydrates. We don't know they are there, we predict they will be there on the basis of the physics. So in the United Kingdom, it looks like there may be a reasonable size of, of resource in methane hydrate. If we look worldwide, it really looks quite large, so, you know, areas and we've talked about this before, where energy is short, for example, Southeast Asia, may be methane hydrate possibilities. So Japan, for example, is very interested in methane hydrates for obvious reasons. The tension between resource and environment, again, is quite large. Resources are colossal. So again, we are unsure of how reliable this is, but Volumes of around 2 times 10 to the 14 meters cubed of methane hydrate have been predicted. And these, even the lowest estimates, dwarf all other hydrocarbon energy reserves, bigger than any other hydrocarbon reserves on Earth. So it's a massive resource, we think. But it's all models, not testing. And the environment, well, again, you would produce gas if you burn the methane. There are unknown effects if you extract this in the subsea. Okay, now to my final unconventional fuel. And I thought I would leave this to last because it's very interesting, I think, for the people of South Arabia in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Because you may not know that you're sitting on a possible hydrogen resource. So, for example, the Semail Ophiolite in Oman, which is this spectacular dark colored mountain range which uh, occurs here in Oman and also in the United, sorry, here in the United Arab Emirates and also in Oman, that naturally generates hydrogen. The way it generates hydrogen is that the ultra basic minerals in, the, in this rock, in this ultra basic rock, when it reacts with water, it produces hydrogen gas, 
Now, we're not sure how fast it does this or under what circumstances, but essentially what we think is that if you have a buried serpentinized ophiolite, like the semile ophiolite in places, and if you have a cap rock above, rather like a conventional oil and gas reservoirs, then you could be generating hydrogen underneath the cap rock. And hydrogen, of course, is a fuel that you could use. It's a non-fossil fuel, but it's a, a, a fuel that you could use. Sorry? Okay. So finally, the resource. So the semilophilite is the largest in the world. It could have uh, an, an enormous hydrogen reserve. Up to 3,000 cubic kilometers of hydrogen could have been produced by the semilophilite. We have no idea. Again, if you burn hydrogen, it's a non-fossil fuel, so it only produces water vapor. Uh, of course, you would have to drill. So for in conclusion, what I tried to show you is a survey of five unconventional fuels, not shale gas. What I'm trying to show you here is a simple diagram of potential against the technology maturity, the maturity of the technology. On the left, you see potential, and again, these are only my ideas, so they could be completely wrong, but shale gas and oil sands have potential. The maturity is high. We already know how to do that. CBM, we're working on it. We have some problems. For example, in the United States, CBM has not been so uh, well developed. UCG, again, is not so well developed. The maturity of the technology is high, is not high. Methane hydrates, the potential could be enormous but the maturity, again, is low. Hydrogen, we have no idea. Its, its potential could be very large, it could be low. The maturity of the technology is extremely low. But one thing I should say straight away is that four of those are limited by carbon emissions. Uh, one very interesting report by Lord Stern recently, picked up by a number of agencies in the UK and the United States, stated that large oil and gas companies have are overvalued because their enormous value relates to the reserves of oil and gas that they book. But of course, in a carb carbon constrained world, which I think we're going to have more and more, CO2 emissions are constrained, how much of that oil and gas will they be able to produce and use? Perhaps less than they've got. And this is true here that possibly Many of these, although they look very good, may be constrained because they are fossil fuels. Of course, hydrogen is not because it doesn't produce CO2 when you burn it. So in summary, there are a lot of unconventional fuels and they probably represent an enormous resource. Much of the technology though is immature uh, and many of the environmental impacts are unknown. We don't know what effect they will have on the environment. But there will certainly be a tension between exploitation and the environment. And one of the speakers yesterday mentioned how important water would be in this area, for example. If water is involved, involved in energy exploitation, there may not be enough. And that could constrain some of these unconventional fuels. But the last point, apart from subsurface hydrogen, all these unconventional fuels are hydrocarbons and probably will be constrained in their use in the future because of the limit of carbon emissions. So although they look good, they are fossil fuels, and so it, it could be that there's the li limits on how much they can be used in the future. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Stevenson. Shukran jazeelan, Professor Stevenson. The Gulf area uh, was and until now is uh, the main player to provide energy with uh, huge reserves of oil and natural gas. Uh, is it going to continue to be the same or it's gonna go into the same race of looking for new resources for oil and natural gas and what are the opportunities to diversify resources do does nature play a role in this area dr brian horsfield 
and from his presentation under the title The Potential for Unconventional Fuel Development in the Arabian Gulf, uh, will answer all these questions and others. Uh, Professor Horsfield is uh, a professor for the biological chemistry and hydrocarbon materials in Berlin Technical University, and uh, he has uh, a research team in the biological research in the Geological Institute with 50 technicians and postgraduate students. He has 30 years of experience in the field of research and development and in upstream and downstream. And as a recognition of his achievements, he is he is the director of research department in the German Research Center for Geosciences. And he has almost 190 studies published. Thank you. Would you please come to the podium, Professor Horsfield? First technical hurdle overcome. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak at the conference. It's really a, a true honour. And uh, I'm looking forward to giving you some insights into uh, some of our work that we've been doing for, the, for, for many years now, but especially over the past uh, seven or eight years uh, concerning shale gas and shale oil. What I'll be trying to do is to apply what we've learned to the uh, case of the Arabian Gulf. We are not specialists on the Arabian Gulf, I need to point that out. But I think you'll find the uh, work that we've uncovered to be, to be uh, important uh, to the development in the area. Right, so I'm not going to go into huge detail here. I think it's important uh, that you know uh, what the organization is that I come from, because in the last talk you were hearing about this conflict between the environment and resources. Um, that is important, it's recognized in Germany as well as the UK. So our research center, which has about 1,100 employees, is studying the whole earth. We're studying using a variety of methods shown on the bottom left. You can't see the details, it doesn't matter. We're studying a whole series of processes, natural processes all the way from earthquakes, tsunamis, um, georesources, paleoclimate, all as part of an earth system uh, study. And the, uh, the idea then is to not only study the natural processes, but the way in which those natural processes impinge upon uh, mankind or society, if you like. So the environment and resources are an integral part together of what we uh, look at. The perspective that we have has already been addressed yesterday. That is, uh, by 2030, the demand for energy will be uh, strongly increased compared to today. Due to world population increase, maybe 9 billion, 50% uh, of the population in cities, 40% more energy needed in 2035. Renewable energy in Germany is an important uh, development. It is growing, but the truth is that uh, it is growing relatively slowly. So fossil energy continues to be important uh, in our country. And so developing that fossil energy is important. The unconventionals are then uh, a very important topic for us. So the key challenges it's not a matter of being able to decide 
uh, resources versus the environment, you have to put those two together. You have to maintain a resource base for economic growth on the one hand, but on the other, you have to manage the degree of environmental and social impact. To emphasize that point, I'll just define what sustainable developments are. These are defined as developments that meet present day needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And there are four components. Uh, the environmental compatibility is most often stressed when you talk about sustainability. But as you can see, the other elements are equally important. Security of supply and economic efficiency are closely associated then with environmental compatibility and, especially in Europe, um, social acceptance. Good, so that's the background. So now let's go forward and uh, look at these gas shales. I don't need to say a lot about gas shales. They've already just been described very, very well. But if you look at the pictures now, you'll see that gas shales are not uh, homogeneous. They're very mixed in layers and uh, smooth layers. You can see the top right, you've got an outcrop. You might just be able to see a geological hammer on the, held up against that uh, rock surface, just for scale. Just to the left of that uh, outcrop, you can see a, a geological log, so electrical logs that are used in geoscience to pick out not only major disconformities that your eye can see, but uh, disconformities that your eye cannot see. Bottom left, uh, we're looking at a core from the Kusaiba formation. So from your part of the world. Look how heterogeneous that is. Bottom right, those, I think, let me see. Yes, I think you can see. Um, in the middle picture, you can see an arrow pointed to pores within these shales. The pores are tiny. We're talking about nanometers. Nobody really understands what a nanometer is because we've never seen it, really, knowingly. But if we go down to the bottom of the picture, you see bacteria are about one micrometer in length. Compare that then with the scale of those pores, much bigger. And a human hair is 30 micrometers in diameter, or up to 150, actually. So th this, is, this is the difficulty then that shale gas exploitation is all about. It's finding the gas located within pores, heterogeneous rocks, some of the pores are very, very, very small. Let's begin globally um, looking at uh, in-place shale gas abundance. Um, top left, you see a, a table that we've put together of estimates for shale gas abundance coming from 1997 through 2011 to 2013. You see that the total is uh, is increasing dramatically so that now the EIA believes that there's twice as much shale gas potential as Rogner believed in 1997. We hear about the US being the place where you find shale gas, but other places have great difficulty uh, extracting gas. Are these numbers uh, realistic then? And the bottom line is uh, order of magnitude wise, uh, yes, you can make calculations and you can actually show that those numbers are reasonable. We've just heard about the mass of carbon tied up in coals, gas hydrates, uh, oil and gas. And that's a huge amount, as, as we've just heard. But please keep in mind that actually most hydrocarbons are found within shales. So not in conventional deposits, they're found in shales. And I'm talking about 10,000 times as much. I'm not suggesting that shale gas is 10 times as abundant producible shale gas, but the amount is huge. So these numbers are okay. But what about the characteristics that you need in order for these shales to actually have enough gas in to make them worthy of serious consideration as a, as a resource. General properties are listed here. These have been put together based on uh, mainly US, uh, you know, arm waving or 
uh, rules of thumb. General properties greater than 20 meters thickness, depth shallower than three to four kilometers, thermal maturity less than 3% uh, vitronite reflectance. What does that mean? It means the rocks have got to have seen a very high temperature in their past in order to generate gas. The rocks have to be organic rich. You've got to generate a lot of gas. And the original organic matter has to have been of a high quality to maximize yield. The gas is adsorbed in part, but porosity is important. And so greater than 4% has been quoted as being the cutoff. So let's uh, zoom uh, into the Arabian Gulf states. Simple plot here, horizontal axis we have the, the countries of the region, and on the vertical axis we have the ages of the rocks. And the black areas you see, these are the uh, gas shale, potential gas shales that are found in the various countries. You'll see that in the United Arab Emirates, there are two. That would be the Silurian and the Jurassic. Same for Bahrain and Qatar, based on our literature review. There are other countries that have many more candidates, but it's still conventionally, in conventional oil and gas terms, the Silurian and the Jurassic, that are the most important. So many potential targets. And I guess the tendency, if you're looking for unconventional gas, will be to start with the known sources of conventional gas, so the Silurian Jurassic. Doesn't mean that you have to stick to that. If you actually start from scratch, you'd begin by looking at all these shales, because it doesn't mean that they're going to be poor, poor sources of gas just because they've not sourced conventional petroleum. Huge table full of uh, information. Don't expect you to be able to uh, read this in detail. But we have listed for Saudi Arabia the various formations on the left that need at least consideration. Look how many. Huge number of uh, formations. Next, what about the age? The variety of ages, all the way from about 100 million years old down to the Ordovician, down to, let's say, 400 million years old. What about the thickness? Big numbers, much bigger than 20 meters. Lithology, that means rock type. Shales are in there, there are other rock types as well. You shouldn't exclude the other rock types because they can be fracked to produce hydrocarbons. Maturity, variable. TOC, or richness, variable. Quality, variable. United Arab, Arab Emirates, not as many uh, options, but still some interesting possibilities uh, here, too. I've already mentioned that the Silurian and the uh, Middle Jurassic are the most likely candidates here. You'll see that I've been putting uh, references from the literature to back up uh, what's in these uh, tables. Right, so, uh, of course, the uh, Arabian Peninsula, well known for its conventional oil, conventional gas. What this cross-section is showing is actually the deeper part of the Gawa structure. So what's it, what it's showing is the gas contained within the Kuf formation, that's the red uh, marked horizons, and the uh, lithology that contains the gas is highly porous, we've just heard about that. It's important to keep in mind that th this region is so productive because of a combination of four elements. The source, which generates the hydrocarbons, the reservoir, which contains now the hydrocarbons, the trap, which is holding uh, the oil and gas in place, and a seal, which is preventing leakage out of that uh, trap. All these elements are important. If we now remove all that stuff and put in the source, this will be, in this case, the uh, Kusaiba, we're talking about this fine-grained stuff containing the gas. Just because we have an excellent source for conventionals doesn't necessarily translate into this being a super gas shale. The point I'm trying to make is that uh, if, you begin, if you're at the beginning, which you are, in looking at unconventionals in this area, don't presume that just because you really hit it off with conventionals that it's going to be the same with unconventionals. You have to work up and see if that is the case. 
Right, let's uh, take a, a quick view of the area. On the left you see, obviously, the Arabian Peninsula. It's actually a, a map that goes all the way from Oman and Yemen in the south up to Iraq in the north. And the different colors are showing depth to basement. That means the depth to which you would not expect any sediments to be found, any gas shells at all. The orange colors show very high, uh, high elevation. And if you go over to the northeast, you see very dark blue colors. This means that you've got big thicknesses of sediments accumulated. And on the right-hand side, you see a cross-section. You can see that's the uh, CD cross-section from the inset uh, map. You can see that the, the rocks basically dip down into a big basin-like shape. The oldest rocks are at the bottom, of course. The youngest are at the top. And if you look on the right-hand side, you might just be able to pick out the depth. 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 uh, meters. If we apply the three to 4,000 meter rule, then it's clear that most of the targets, especially uh, in the east, would be uh, Jurassic and younger age. So you would exclude a lot of the older rocks. Sorry? Two minutes, my goodness. And if we go over to the left, that's where you see that the Silurian could come into play. But depth is not the only important thing. It's how these rocks have been cooked in the geologic past. The Cretaceous is shallow, but it's not generated anything. The Upper Jurassic is deeper. It has generated maybe oil, but there are areas the gas prone. The Silurian is found to be very mature gas prone, but it's very deep. So, next point. This is, these are some comments from uh, a small independent from the USA. You don't apply conventional rules to unconventional deposits. You've got to drill many wells. Bottom right shows that. Next point. We see a table here which shows the variability in uh, these different attributes of the uh, American gas shales. The depth, the pressures, the temperatures, it's highly variable. So it's not that all USA gas shales are good and the rest of the world is bad. What do we have to do then to decide the real case for the, uh, the source rocks here or the gas shales here? You have to apply specialized analyses. And I'm not going to attempt to, to go into that now. This shows that we have a whole list of uh, geological analytical methods that address gas in place and the risk of how can you fracture the rock. That's what's shown on the right. These parts shown in red are the most crucial. These are the things that have to be looked at in detail. Fluid behavior is one of those points. And at the top right, you can just about see a strange diagram that shows a plot of pressure and temperature and some bubble-like shapes. What these bubble-like shapes are are phase envelopes. This is something that our engineers use in order to determine whether petroleum is likely to be in a gaseous form, a liquid form, or a mixed form. Let's look briefly at Texas here, South Texas, the Eagleford. The green, the yellow, and the orange zones that you see, these are picking out areas where oil, wet gas condensate, and dry gas can be produced. If you look in the green area, you'll see some yellow spots appearing. That is, you've got high GOR in areas where you should not be having high GOR. This comes down to this phase behavior that needs to be looked at in detail in order to really determine what the in situ properties are and what the produced hydrocarbons look like. Good, I'm winding up. I'll leave this behind. I'm not going to talk about this. The current state of knowledge, this is a Schlumberger presentation. It shows that shale heterogeneities can be documented in great detail using well logs in order to recognize which zones fracture and which don't. That would need to be done here. The broader picture, 
And now coming back to what Mike Stevenson was saying, uh, shale gas can be viewed as a new opportunity for various reasons. Of course, the concerns are important. For example, uh, water volumes that are needed, seismicity, and so on. The right-hand side shows that water is available, albeit um, not easily replenished in the subsurface. The, the water that you need for fracking doesn't have to be drinking water, by the way. Right. Summary. Shale resource plays are at an early stage of development uh, here. Each shale gas resource, resource, uh, resource system is unique, and you've got to actually merge together the technological developments and the geo system. You can't exclude one or the other. I think we're all well equipped now to address these challenges. Of course, political, environmental, and acceptance issues can be making or breaking exploration. Particularly, this has been the case in Europe. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, it will be good now at the beginning to involve a broad range of stakeholders in studying the development of gas shales here. Industry clearly is important. The aqua for people as well. Uh, as well. You don't ruin one resource by developing another. So the last point um, for companies that are coming into the area, of course, shale resource industry is global, so company footprints go with them. An environment is important. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Horsfeld. Now we can proceed to the discussion session. We will take uh, questions from the audience. Please. Anas Al Haji, NGP, Management. Before I make my comments on uh, Dr. Kim's uh, presentation, I would like to make a disclaimer. Uh, by the way, I do apologize for my horsey voice. Uh, I do own a property, a producing property on the Barnett that he cited uh, in his presentation. And uh, we do have over 60 portfolio companies operating uh, throughout North America. Uh, some of them are on those basins he mentioned in his uh, presentation. Uh, this comment is for the press. Whatever I'm going to say, please, this is not for quotation. Again, this is not for quotation because I'm going to mention some specifics that I don't like to be quoted on. Uh, you mentioned uh, Arthur uh, Berman. Uh, Arthur Berman was fired from his job for misrepresentation of the data. Arthur Berman, in his analysis, he analyzed the financial statements of the companies that operate only in dry gas fields. He never questioned the shale gas. He questioned the viability of dry gas production from the Hensville when natural gas prices were $2. So his statements cannot be taken against the shale gas industry in general. He was just questioning the financial statements of certain companies drilling in dry gas fields. Yet, none of his companies that he picked went bankrupt. None. And from pure academic point of view, it will be nice to mention those who wrote against Arthur Berman in your presentation. The second point, you showed that picture of the lady pointing at the barnet. The date for that picture is extremely important. Why? Because every single well in the Barnett was making money in 2007 and 2008. Every single well. Gas prices were $14 at that time. So to say that they were not making well, um, they were not making money while natural gas prices were $14 is nonsense. $14. So the date for that picture is extremely important. But there is an explanation for that picture. The fact is, when gas prices declined, 
And we had that land rush where companies were rushing to sign the leases. The lease states that companies have to drill within three years. If they don't drill, then they lose the lease. So if they have a lease of $200 million and the cost of the well is $8 million, they will drill that well even if it's a dry hole. I cannot go to that dry hole and say, well, this is bad shale because I couldn't find gas in it. The fact is the land rush followed by a decline in prices and the requirements in the lease led to that picture at a specific time uh, and, and most likely it is uh, in late 2009. Um, the, uh, you, you picked certain uh, plays uh, in the United States, but uh, for some reason I did not see the most lucrative uh, plays. I did not see anything about the Granite Wash, for example, or the Faithville, or the Woodford, uh, or, uh, or the Cotton Valley, for example. The numbers you mentioned, the prices and the economics of those basins, those are taken from bank statements that are evaluating specialized, specialized public companies. That public companies that specialize only in oil and gas in certain fields and that's it. Those are not a representative sample of those fields. Those numbers are only good for stock picking. If you want to invest in the stocks of those companies, then those numbers are good. Why? Because the integrated companies are not included and the private companies like ours are not included. The largest increase in oil production in the Eagle Ford came in from Shell. The second one, BHP. The lowest cost in all those fields is coming from the private companies, not from the public companies. So those, got, those prices are not representative of, that, of the share revolution in the United States. Just to give you one example and I will finish. One of the companies in the Marcellus went public just 10 days ago. I'm not going to name the company. On the day it went public, the price of stock went up by 50%. The second day, another 30%. What that means? Because their cost was lower than what the public information was and the investors realized the value uh, in it. Thank you. So, Dr. Uh Kim, do you have anything to add, or what's your comment regarding all these issues? So Al, Al Haji, thank you for your comments. And my information here, my intention was not to like a highlight Arthur Berman and others because they are, I know that they are, you know, sort of uh, criticized by, by many. My intention was to provide uh, balanced views. Okay, then. Uh, Still, I think we have, uh, you know, those emerging new shale plays and old shale plays. Uh, I think that uh, still, you know, Marcellus and these new shale plays are still in the growth stage. We need to, we need yet to test those, you know, sort of uh, skeptics, you know, assumptions. So that um, I appreciate your, your comments and I look forward to exchanging uh, those information in my future research. And I'm, I still have uh, some doubt about the long-term viability of, of these different shale plays. It depends on, you know, uh, plays, but I look forward to uh, exchange some of your informations, uh, you know, by private companies. And, and another thing that, that uh, I, I, I add to uh, my presentation is that uh, the, the possibility of uh, major corporations uh, getting involved in this shale place, because so far independent companies, the science and, and mathematics of these independent companies and the science and mathematics of major companies must be different. So that's one thing that we, we need to uh, pay attention to in, in the future also. Thank you. Okay. Please. Thank you, Mehmood um, Hassan Khan.
from Pakistan, Unit Head of Geopolitics and Economics. Uh, uh, two uh, intellectuals have spoken about the unconventional energy resources. Which I understand unconventional stand for the further diversification of the energy resources. So my question specifically on United Arab Emirates. <clears throat> UAE has already initiated uh, effective measures to diversify its uh, energy energy resources mix. Mm -hmm. What are the geological red lines in the development, development of unconventional energy resources in GCC and particularly in UAE? And my second question, what are the prospects of unconventional energy resources in GCC and how these could be surfaced and materialized in the days to come. Thank you. So, Dr. Stevenson, can you just uh, answer this question? Uh, I wasn't quite clear on question, the second part, but the, f the first part, you're asking, if I understand right, um, how this area, um, GCC and the UAE, might diversify in terms of unconventionals. Um, so if you, if you heard what uh, Brian Horsfield was saying, there's clearly you know, unconventional potential in this area, uh, in the sense that there are shales uh, right through the, the geological sequence. And we know that those shales have sourced conventional oil and gas. So that, in a way, shows that the first test is passed so, for example, the Kasaiba, which is a famous uh, Paleozoic source rock, which sources a huge amount of Paleozoic oil and gas in, the, in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, probably on the other side of the Gulf as well. The fact that that has produced oil and gas shows that it, it might be a shale that you could actually frack. So, and there are shales throughout the, the sequence. So I don't doubt that uh, shales are present in the Middle East. On the other ones that I mentioned, so the five that I mentioned, for example, uh, oil sands, hydrogen, underground coal gasification, coal bed methane, methane hydrates, well, to my knowledge, coal isn't particularly well represented in the geological column in the Middle East. I know that in the northern part of the Middle East, in Jordan and Turkey, there are coal deposits. But to my knowledge, there aren't a lot of coals in this area. Uh, and so I doubt whether UCG or coal bed methane would mean an awful lot in this area. Methane hydrates are interesting, though one, one wouldn't expect in a warm, shallow sea like the Red Sea there to be any methane hydrates. I know that there are companies in the Middle East that are um, actively exploring for methane hydrates in the deeper seas out in the, the, the Gulf of Arabia and out towards the uh, southern, northern parts of the Indian Ocean. So methane hydrates are a possibility. Uh, on hydrogen, as I mentioned, uh, the Smile Ophiolite, which spreads between uh, Oman and the United Arab Emirates, is the world's largest expanse of ultra-basic igneous rock. And uh, you know, we don't know what its potential is for hydrogen, but essentially you drill holes in the ophiolites here and it's possible that hydrogen might be produced. You might have to frack it, you might have to look very carefully at the geology, but there may be uh, the same kind of conventional traps which you would normally expect to find oil underneath you might find hydrogen underneath if the, the conditions are right. And this is really a very, uh, a big, a big, a big uh, we, don't, uh, we don't really understand hydrogen at the moment, but it's, it's a possibility. So uh, in summary, what, what I was saying in summary to your question is that, you know, this area is world famous for its conventional oil and gas. It is huge oil and gas. Uh, there are possibilities for unconventional in terms of shale, and there are possibilities for methane hydrates and possibly for hydrogen. 
But on the coal side, I think the, that, that's limited. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevenson. Any more questions? Please, in the back. عز الصوافي مركز الهي لتعليم الكبر. عز الصوافي هي سنتر. I would like to ask my question. What is the future of the unconventional fossil fuel in the UAE for the next few years? A while ago, Professor Michael Stevenson has mentioned that one way or another on the same question. But in general, despite the presence of a potential and the possibilities of producing unconventional fossil fuels in the UAE in particular and in the GCC in general, it has provided the conventional fossil fuels which make it on the short run and medium run not available due to the high costs of producing unconventional fossil fuels and due to the environmental effects and impacts uh, that till now uh, are not uh, really stable and clear enough and therefore there is a dire need to look uh, into the sources of unconventional fossil fuels in the UAE and in the Gulf uh, uh, states in general. Okay, thank you very much. Before closing the session, we just would like to hear uh, our guest and the speaker's comment on these cartoons which is uh, summarized some of the as aspects and issues were uh, discussed during this panel. So, Dr. Kim, this is the first uh, picture. Uh, can you just comment on this within one minute? Okay, I think that we need to uh, factor this environmental degradation and health risks into uh, economic equations also. That's important. That's what's happening also in Chinese shale gas development. Dr. Stevenson, within one minute. Uh, I think really what it, uh, it shows you is uh, that what I was saying during my talk, which is this tension between unconventional, this, in this case shale gas, and, and environment. And although some parts of the world don't see a strong tension, in countries like the UK, the tension is extremely strong in the sense that it's so strong that it could stop shale gas happening. And I think what this cartoon is saying is, uh, you know, there are jobs uh, in shale gas. There is, you know, in places which have suffered from the economic downturn, there is, a, in a sense, uh, a possibility to, to, uh, uh, to regenerate the economy with shale gas. But at the same time, there, is, there are issues of environmental concern which may stop that. So I think what it shows us as geologists and scientists is that we have a job not only to understand the, the resource, but probably even more important to understand the environmental effects and also reassure the public that those environmental effects won't be bad enough, won't be too bad. So I think it's really brought resource and environmental science both into the equation and both have to be dealt with. Thank you. I guess, uh, Dr. Horsfeld, I will give you two or three minutes. Sorry? I guess I will give you two or three minutes. We did not hear your voice during the discussion <laughs> session. So take two your three time. Minutes, you mean not one or two? Okay. Um, well, this really uh, is a, an excellent uh, summary of the effect of how facts are reported, basically, in the media. What we see here is really a, a visualization of the effects of gas land. You'll remember that if you go back to, I think, 2011, when the, this reactionary film first came out, the effects, certainly uh, outside of America, were quite uh, dramatic. And it brought about a real pressure upon shale gas development. In other words, in countries like Germany or France, and for a while in the UK, 
even some of the Eastern European countries, they're actually putting moratoria or putting things on hold because of that react, those reactionary statements. I think it's quite important, I think, to uh, consider resources and environment together. Everybody knows that. But the bottom line is distinguishing fact, fact from fiction. And so to put together the pros and the cons of shale gas development, and there are always pros and cons in everything we do, let's make those decisions based on facts. And the way that we, in our small academic way, have tried to overcome some of these problems with misrepresentation of data by both sides, pro and con, is to put together a shale gas information platform. If you were to go now into the internet, type that in, you would get a shale gas information platform position on shale gas, the for and against arguments. And unless you do that, then you, you're really just caught up in rhetoric, not in facts. If in the United Arab Emirates, you say that you want to diversify, that's fine. That surely means knowing what you really have under your feet, right? Do we have unconventionals or do we not have unconventionals? Is it part of the equation or is it not? You have to make that decision based upon facts concerning environmental impact, potential environmental impacts, and potential uh, advantages to the economy as well. So I think you have to evaluate what you have under your feet, and then you can decide what kind of an energy mix you really want. That's basically where Germany is right now. It's basically where the UK is. It's where Poland is. Everybody has an energy mix. You make your decisions based on facts, hopefully. Thanks, Dr. Horsfeld. At the end of this session, we would like to thank uh, uh, the um, the audience for their kind attention. We would like to thank the panelists for their efforts in enriching this session. And hopefully we have 15 minutes break and afterwards we shall resume our fourth session. Shukran. Yeah, I'm not a man that enjoys not a man that enjoys photos myself either. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa al khair. Most gracious, the most merciful. First of all, I have to apologize in the name of Muhammad Matfai as he couldn't participate in this session as the general secretariat had to discuss the waste of Abu Dhabi today. My name is Munir Bouganim and I will mm, chair the last session of this conference. Al-Hadaf of um, unconventional fossil fuel, the climate and environmental impacts and the implications on the global energy mix. A subject that has been discussed thoroughly, I believe, today and yesterday in this first annual um, conference. What are the considerations that governments should look at while developing policies, uh, considering relatively more expensive 
fuel and more polluting for the producing countries. At the same time, how geopolitical reasons and countries' dependencies on different sources of fuel will shape such future policies. I'm pleased to introduce to you the first panelist, Dr. Francis O'Sullivan, uh, who is the Director of Research and Analysis for the MIT Energy Initiative and a lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His research interests span a range of topics related to energy technologies, policy, and economics. His current research is focused on unconventional oil and gas resources, the energy water nexus, and solar energy. He has extensive expertise regarding the production dynamics and associated economics of North America's shale plays. His work also includes study, the study of global gas market dynamics and the LNG trade. And he's actively studying and the implication of international energy markets of emerging unconventional hydrocarbon resource plays, particularly those in China and Australia. He has written and spoken widely on, on these topics and has made presentations on the President's Office of Science and Technology Policy, the United States Environmental, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the Brookings Institute, the Center of Strategic and International Studies, uh, the National Governors Association, the National Association of Regulated Utility Commissioners um, at Sierra Week, the American Physical Society, and to a range of other academic policy and industrial forum, industry forums. Uh, he's also a member of the National Academics Roundtable on Science and Technology for Sustainability. Dr. O'Sullivan received his PhD from MIT, and he's going to discuss today the challenges that relate to the variability of the resource, uh, resources productivity, which impacts the economics of production. Dr. O'Sullivan, welcome to the floor. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me, of course, begin by thanking uh, the organizers so very much for their, their kind invitation. Um, so clearly, over the past, uh, over the past day, um, the, uh, the agenda has been exploring the, uh, the implications of unconventional gas and unconventional oil in the broader energy system. Uh, they are multifaceted, to say the least. What I'm going to attempt to do now in the next, uh, this next few minutes is to articulate a few of the nuances um, that are important drivers in understanding the economic profile of these resources, specifically as it relates to the US, um, and to link that to uh, a couple of important uh, more macro energy system issues, specifically regarding uh, LNG exports and the US entering that market. Um, to begin, I'd just like to provide a little bit of context. So clearly, uh, everybody here is keenly aware that the past decade has been a period of tremendous change uh, for, for the energy system writ large, certainly in the United States. Um, gas, has, uh, gas has, of course, uh, emerged as a, uh, a, major, uh, a major source of uh, excitement among our commercial community. Uh, there's a real uh, perspective now that we're going to, that we're going to be seeing a much more gas-centric future uh, in the US than had been previously, uh, previously thought. Um, just a few points here to illustrate the impact of the emergence of shale gas in the US. So the first on the left uh, is, is an important graph. Uh, what this graph shows is in blue the, the spot price of our natural gas at our Henry Hub index point in the United States and how it's evolved since 2000. Uh, and along with uh, the spot price, what I'm also doing is I'm plotting in red a, a line that illustrates what the price of gas would have been had its price been linked to oil with a 10 to 1 ratio. So one barrel of oil is worth 10 times what a thousand cubic feet. Now, that's a, uh, that's a rule of thumb, actually, that, uh, that has existed in the United States for a long, long time that linked uh, what the price of oil and gas would likely be. It's rough, but it, it makes sense. There's an energy arbitrage difference. That means that uh, on an energetic basis, a barrel of oil would typically trade for six times 
the price of a uh, thousand cubic feet of gas, but because of the challenges in handling gas and so on, there was a discount to that. And you will see that uh, from 2000 up till about 2008, 2009, that rough linkage held pretty well. And certainly before 2000, that was also the case. But since 2000, what has happened is that the price of gas has what we turn now term decoupled from the price of oil in the United States. So today, oil and gas in the United, Stra United States trade at a ratio that's much closer to 30, 35 to 1 than the kind of historical 8 to 10 to 1 ratio. And that makes gas a much more attractive fuel for a whole host of, uh, for a whole host of applications. Um, and, uh, and that is, of course, what's driving the gas-centric future vision. Now, one area where this is a very specific application is in, uh, is in power generation, of course. So historically, the US has produced the lion's share of its electricity from coal. And, and that's illustrated, in, uh, that's illustrated on, uh, on the graph on the right. What we have here is the monthly generation of electricity in terawatt hours in the United States since January of uh, 2008. What you'll notice is during that period of time, the generation on average from coal has been dropping. It's a secular decline. It's declining in straight line, essentially. And that from gas has been rising. And a very important uh, dynamic, or a very important uh, point was reached in April uh, of 2012, when we in the United States generated as much electricity from gas as we did from coal for the very first time. Now, that particular point uh, was allowed to happen because we had an exceptionally low gas price for a period of a few weeks, uh, which was not really representative of the longer term gas price. But, um, but it does, it is indicative of this uh, greater focus on gas going forward. So, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure this has been addressed already. Uh, shale gas has led to a dramatic increase in assessments of what is technically recoverable. So again, the graph on the, on, the, on the left is illustrating how the assessment of technically recoverable gas resource in the United States has changed over time. And you'll note that between 1990 and 2005, you know, nothing major happened. We produced gas, we added a little bit of extra gas to our assessed recoverable resource because of technology change and so on. But, uh, but the, the ratio is relatively constant. But since 2005, we've had this dramatic increase in the assessed uh, uh, volume of technically recoverable gas, and that's all due to the shale. But, you know, and the current assessment stands at over 2,700 trillion cubic feet, which, uh, which, uh, which is a lot, considering that the US produces on the order of 25 trillion cubic feet each year to supply its, uh, to supply its, uh, its domestic demand. Those numbers, though, are essentially academic. That's 100 years, at least, of gas um, you know, will we even be producing gas in 100 years? That's a very open-ended question. What is much more relevant is the shorter-term impact that shale has had, and that's illustrated on the right. What I'm showing here is the ramp-up in production from shale resources over the past uh, six or seven years. The United States has gone from essentially producing no gas at all from shale resources in 2005 to a point today where shales are supporting 40% uh, of, uh, of production. That's remarkable. It's remarkable considering the scale of US demand to be able to ramp that up so quickly. And also I will point out that, that to get to 40% of current production, um, you basically have to do nothing else but drill for shale and other unconventional gas resources. So the focus in the North American setting for producing gas has shifted entirely uh, to these unconventional, uh, unconventional resources. Uh, I don't want to spend much time on this, uh, except to say that on the previous slide I said 2,700 trillion cubic feet of technically recoverable resource. That is just one point, it's a mean estimate, in quite a wide sea of uncertainty. And, and this is just illustrative of that, even in the US where we've drilled 25,000 contemporary shale wells, we still have a wide band of uncertainty regarding how much is likely going to be uh, technically recoverable. 
Uh, a thousand trillion cubic feet of shale is more or less the, the contemporary estimate, mean estimate. Uh, but you can have a high estimate of more than twice that and a low estimate of, of less than half that. Now, shifting from volumes, because we know in reality that the gas is there, what's much more relevant is how much this costs to develop. Um, so there is this perception in the United States, and it's an important issue with regard to policy making and so on, that these shales are low cost resources. And in reality, they're, they're competitive cost resources, but they're not truly low cost resources. Uh, I'm just illustrating here uh, on the left a disaggregation of the total US natural gas supply curve into its various components. A conventional gas, uh, coal bed methane, tight sandstones, and shale. Uh, the important point is, as you'll note, is that shale really represents the large, large portion of the lower cost of gas. There's a lot of shale gas available in the United States at less than six dollars per uh, per thousand cubic feet per million MBTU. Uh, but there's a nuance to the resource today and to our production of it today. And that is that unlike conventional gas, where we can literally go and find low cost fields and just produce that low cost gas. Today with the shales in the United States, every time we drill gas, we effectively sample the entire supply curve. The entire supply curve. So what do I mean by that? Well, on the right, the graph illustrates the average initial, uh, the initial production rate of every well drilled in, uh, every horizontal shale well drilled in the Barnett Shale, uh, which is uh, the, the play with the largest number of wells, between 2005 and 2012. About 12,000 wells in total. And the important point to take away here is that that distribution is very, very wide, and it's skewed. It's skewed. So what this means is that we do produce some extremely high-performing wells, but every year we also produce, uh, we also drill some very low-performing wells. Now, some folk will come along and they'll say, well, we're getting better at drilling the wells. And that is certainly true, but uh, every year we still see the significant variance uh, within each of the individual plays. So on the, uh, what I'm showing here is uh, the graph on the, on the left illustrates the disaggregation of that 2005 to 2012 distribution uh, by vintage. And what you'll see is that each year, moving from 2005 to 2012, this S-curve has shifted, uh, shifted to the right. Shifting to the right effectively means higher performance on average. But the variance between, let's say, P80 and P20 is still very large, easily a factor of 3x, which means that ultimately for producers, this is not a game of drilling one or two wells, but it's a portfolio game. You need to sample this entire distribution. You need to drill tens, certainly, probably closer to 100 wells per play in order to effectively sample the distribution. And then your economics will be determined by what the mean economics uh, look like. And often they look pretty reasonable. One nuance, though, that's important to bear in mind is that although, as the graph on the left shows, the absolute productivity has been improving year to year, if we consider the fact that we have been drilling longer and longer horizontals each year, you'll actually note that the productivity per foot or per meter of well has been dropping. Uh, it's dropped in the Barnett, and it has dropped in every other play. And that's not surprising at all. It's reflective of the classic creaming process that you see in all oil and gas development. What we see today is operators are extremely effective at identifying more or less the sweet spots in plays quickly through the rough macro geological and geophysical and petrophysical analysis that's possible. They find the higher quality acreage and then they drill in that acreage initially. But the problem is that once they start drilling in that acreage, they are then subject to this inherent variability within the rock, which they're finding quite difficult to manage. Now, <clears throat> just a comment on that difficulty. Uh, so we, we heard in the previous section just some very important comments regarding uh, the fundamental physics of this rock. 
Today, shales are really not well understood, even at the fundamental characterization level, and certainly not well understood in terms of how we manage production from, uh, from the rocks. Uh, we need much, much better models, uh, much, much better, deeper insight into the physics of, uh, of, of gas storage and transport within these rocks before you can manage this variability. Um, just to point that out, and just to point out this issue regarding, uh, regarding core and non-core acreage and variability, what I'm just going to illustrate here is some, uh, some work that uh, myself and some colleagues just recently did where we applied uh, formal spatial statistical tools to look at how productivity varied in the Barnett. Uh, on the left, the graph illustrates an assessment of productivity of individual wells, each of those dots is a well, and we looked at the productivity of that well relative to every other well in the entire ensemble, in the overall play. The red wells were wells where there are, the performance was statistically significantly higher, and the blues uh, significantly lower. And unsurprisingly, this distribution corresponds entirely with where we know or where we consider today uh, the core and the non-core in that play. But operators in the United States rarely, if ever, own the entire play. Uh, in fact, operators' uh, area that's relevant is often much, much smaller, thousands of acres or maybe 50 or 60,000 acres. When we, when we executed the test again for a much more relevant, operator-relevant lens scale, you'll note uh, on the figure on the right that uh, much of the red and blue has disappeared. In fact, the red that you can see is overstated because of the density of the, uh, the wells there. That, uh, that beige, that yellow color, that indicates that productivity was statistically random for that well within, within the bounds uh, of the test. So what this means is that for an operator, you have to be in the core. That's very important. But once you are in the core, you are subject to a salient vari variability within the rock. And this has tremendous implications for the year-to-year -year macro supply curve for the United States, and indeed right now for anywhere else that would choose to produce a lot of shale gas. Uh, what I have here are three retrospective supply curves that have, um, that, that's looked at the, all the shale gas that's been produced in the US in, in this case, 2009, 10, and 11, and, uh, and built out what the break-even price was for that gas. And you'll note that each of the supply curves has this distinctive S shape, which is reflective of the, of the variance, the well-to-well -well variance. Uh, importantly, though, you'll also note that the supply curves have been falling, and that has been due to the incredible uh, operational enhancement that operators have been able to achieve in reducing costs in the development of these resources. The ovals represent what the average break-even uh, Henry Hobb price was in the United States uh, in each of those three years. So you'll see that each year, uh, an, a significant portion of the shale resource is very ac economic, but a significant portion is not. And this again gets back to the point that it is the portfolio return that is now very important for operators. Um, so, and I'm going to quickly turn to a few comments on LNG uh, and then wrap up because we're going to have a more moderated discussion afterwards. The emergence of shale, the abundance of shale, and its relatively attractive economics have meant that uh, the US and many, many entities in the US are now looking to export shale gas, export gas and, and, and shale gas. Um, the US is in now a relatively uh, competitive position to do so, particularly to Asia. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the stack on the, uh, on the right of, uh, of this graph illustrates a current uh, typical X-ship uh, Japanese uh, price. It's, you know, 18, 17, 16 dollars, uh, and the current uh, cost of getting that gas to, to Asia from the United States, assuming a four or five dollar uh, shale Henry Hub price. And what you'll find is that, uh, you know, there is often uh, four or five or maybe six dollars of spread between uh, what, the, uh, what the, the price would be for US gas to get it there and what the price of gas actually is in Asia. Um, this is a big opportunity, and we see a lot of activity now with Asian buyers in particular coming into the market and looking to capture, capture some of this rent that's possible. 
Uh, I will say, though, that uh, certainly given four, five, or six dollar gas in the United States, any large scale do, export do more to, minutes, huh? to, to Europe is, uh, is unlikely. Uh, in the European market, you see increasingly hub indexation being added to, uh, to gas pricing. Uh, from the Norwegians and the Russians and so on. And that will likely mean that, uh, that it's not going to be a particularly fruitful market for U.S. exports. Uh, this, again, just illustrates uh, the, com the competitive position of the U.S. relative to some projects that are in the pipeline. Um, so here we have on the horizontal axis uh, likely capacity coming online uh, and on the vertical axis the X-ship break-even price in Tokyo Harbor uh, and then the, uh, the regions where that gas is likely to come from. Uh, Middle East expansion and so on, that's going to be extremely cheap and will be highly competitive. Uh, but where the U.S. is slotted in is in this, uh, is in this uh, large bulk of U.S. brownfield gas which has displaced, frankly, a lot of the expansion potential that was seen from Australia, for example. Um, so just one final comment <clears throat> uh, on, on U.S. exports. LNG exports are controversial in the U.S. Uh, people are concerned that if we export a lot of gas, we will erode the competitiveness uh, of U.S. industry, lead to rising prices, of course, and so on. Um, I mean, they are fair comments in reality, but the scale of U.S. exports are likely to be significantly below the number of applications that are currently in the pipeline. Right now, there are applications to export over 30 billion cubic feet per day. That's almost half of our total daily production. Um, six, uh, six BCF has been approved. And that seems about right for the medium term in terms of what will be approved. Maybe one or two other projects, but not significantly more. So LNG exports will be important, but will not, will not overwhelm the US, uh, the US market. And so then finally, just some synthesis. So certainly shale is here, the volumes are enormous. The economics though are a little bit nuanced. It's not really cheap gas. What it is is a very large, moderate cost resource for the US. Uh, lots of shale gas, of course, internationally, but those economics, as I'm sure you've heard, are going to be more challenged and it's much more complicated. Fundamentally, though, the state of knowledge, in terms of science, is still not really where it needs to be. And as we learn more about the resource, progress will be made on the economics and particularly on that variability. Uh, the environmental concerns, uh, I haven't addressed it here, but they're very, very real, though likely manageable in most settings. Shale may not be right for every setting, and that's certainly the case in the United States and it will be the case elsewhere. But there are also places where shale does work and it can be managed. And then in terms of LNG exports, the US will be a competitive player in the medium term, but the overall scale of exports is likely not, to, uh, not going to uh, immediately alter uh, gas dynamics in the US uh, for the medium term. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll end and uh, I'll turn it back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. For uh, talking about uh, the challenges in productivity, the trends, and uh, uh, giving your uh, final sy synthesis. I would like to call uh, Professor Peter Stiles uh, to the stage on, to talk about uh, the environment, uh, environmental impact and climate impact of uh, conventional uh, fuel. Uh, professor Stiles, uh, um, he is a professor of applied environmental geophysics at uh, Keel University he has been the head of the School of Earth Sciences and Geography and director of the Research Institute for Environment, Physical Science and Mathematics. He's a fellow of the Geological Society, a chartered geologist, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, a fellow of the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, and a member of the American Geophysical Union and the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers. Uh, he was appointed to chair the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, Department of Trade and, in excuse me, and Industry, uh, Criteria Proposals Group for Subsurface Exclusion Criteria for Geological Disposal of Radioactive Waste, which reported to government in May 2007. He was also a member of the Royal Society Committee on Non- 
proliferation of nuclear weapons and has been a member of the uh, geosphere characterization uh, panel of the nuclear decommissioning authority he's a past pres president of the geological society of london the oldest national geological society in the world founded in 1807 and he was the president of uh, the British Association of the Advancement of Science Geology section for 2007 and was listed for the first time in Who's Who in 2008. He's an uh, editor-in-chief of Geoscientist. He's also the president of the International Commission for Hydrocarbon-Related uh, Seismicity, which is currently reporting on the Emilia uh, Romagna earthquake uh, swans in northern Italy, which caused 12 billion euros of damage in 2012, and he's trying unsuccessfully to be part retired. Um, Professor Stiles is going to talk about a case study from uh, the UK um, uh, about a fracturing of a UK shale gas uh, well. Welcome, Professor Stiles. Salam alaikum. And shukran. I did my PhD in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. I have worked extensively in Saudi, in Kuwait, and to some extent in the Emirates, so it's very nice to be back with you again. Well, we've had a lot of interest in questions on the environment aspects of uh, unconventionals, particularly shale gas. So, in actual fact, that's what I'm going to talk to you about here. Now, this picture is of me in front of the Houses of Parliament. Now, usually only ministers and BBC world presenters get to stand there, but uh, Shale Gas managed to get me interviewed in front of there, for which I'm very grateful. Now, we've talked about this extensively. There are a range of rock types and fascies which contain gas of various kinds. Do we have a pointer? Well, on the bottom right, we have what we would call a conventional reservoir, which is a porous sandstone, which can contain gas, it can, can contain water, it can, can contain oil, and they flow easily in and out of that sandstone. Above that, we have a sandstone which is uh, rather less uh, tractable to this flow, but it is still possible to get a gas out of that, tight gas. I'll, drop to, I'll go to the left. We have coal. Now, coal contains volume for volume 10 times as much methane as the equivalent volume of sandstone because the methane is held as a liquid like layer within the structure. And Mike has talked a little bit about it. And then we have shale gas. And shales are a bit of a mixture because some of the gas is free and some of it is trapped, but the pores are tiny and they are not very well connected which means extracting methane from shales is problematic. And as Francis has said, we actually have a huge variety of things we would call shale. Some of them are not just clay. If they are, then they wouldn't frack. We have large components of sand. We have large components of carbonate rocks. And all of those would fall within the general category of shales. Now, we've heard a lot about the U.S. The U.S. has huge resources, huge reserves, too, of both oil shales and gas, extending all the way across the border and some of the largest lying in Canada. But Mike Stevenson's people in uh, the British Geological Survey have just done an analysis of the um, resource base for the northern part of the U.K. Now, this is only three counties out of the UK, Yorkshire, Lancashire, and a little bit of Cheshire to the south where I live. And the limits go between 800 TCFs and more than 1,000 TCFs. Okay. Our yearly usage in the UK is about three TCFs. Now, if we use more gas, it will be higher, but at an extraction rate of 10%, that actually is 25 to 50 years of UK gas consumption. That is in the northern part only of the UK. So this is obviously why we are interested. Mike might fill you in in more details later. Now also why are we interested? Because about 55% of our generation is coal. But because of 
European U Union regulation on flue gas, we are closing six of our coal-fired power stations by the end of next year, which will take something like eight gigawatts of generation capacity out of our base load. That is equivalent to one day per week without electricity. I don't know if you read the Financial Times this morning. It said there, are, there is likely to be another spat between Russia and Ukraine, which may, limit the, which may limit the flow of Russian gas into the European pipelines. In 2009, that was cut off completely. So there are issues to do with availability of energy and also its security. So this is of great interest to the UK and, I have to say, to the rest of Europe, although they, they haven't yet realised that. But to get this gas out of shale, it's not that easy. Because you have to, as this cartoon says, drill down, and in the UK to about 3,000 to 4,000 metres, turn your borehole horizontally, which is relatively easy, and then you must make fractures in the shale in order to provide pathways for the gas to escape. Now that rock is under the weight of three kilometres of rock. And so you have to actually force water at about 10,000 pounds per square inch into that rock to create fractures. Now if you then extracted that water, those fractures would close under that pressure. So in order to make them permeable conduits, you must simultaneously put sand into them or some more expensive material, which you can buy, if you like, at much greater cost, and some chemicals with it. And we'll talk about that in a second. But 99.5% of what you put into a frac is water and sand, which are, by the way, chemicals, SiO2, and H2O. Now, we've had a lot of fuss about fracking in Europe. Hydrofracturing is not new in the UK. I monitored the very first hydrofrac with my PhD students in 1988 with BP in Beckingham in Lincolnshire. It's been carried out for water. It's been carried out for geothermal energy and is always required for the extraction of geothermal energy for granite, from granites. Let, let's not forget that. It's carried out sometimes for coal bed methane. And here is microseismic activity, a small earthquake, which I monitored in 1988. Sorry. We've actually had more than 200 fracks in the UK to date. Uh, Cheshire, where I live, this is 1992. West Sussex in 1991, which is where there's been a lot of demonstration. And Germany, in fact, has carried out 250 fracks in the Schleswig-Holstein uh, Saxony region, uh, usually for tight gas. So fracking is not quite as unusual and has not generally attracted very much media or any other attention. This is a commonly held view, perhaps slightly justifiable, of fracking as uh, pumping some uh, tremendously toxic materials into the ground which are kept secret. And about one, water, sand chemicals and evasiveness. Now, there's a certain amount of truth to this, but the evasiveness is because of commercial interests. Because if you tell everybody what's in it, they can make it themselves. And in actual fact, when I'm doing these lectures in the UK, I make some fracking fluid from a big jug of water and chemicals I have bought at the university shop. Right? Vinegar, lemon juice, jelly baby sweets, washing up liquid, and sand that I got out of a, a bag we have in my laboratory. That is most of the chemicals. They cost virtually nothing. Okay, this is what sometimes in it, is in it. Acids. Okay, it sounds awful. Your stomach contains hydrochloric acid. That's how you digest your food. Salt, right. cosmetic materials, antifreeze, which you don't even know about, but we spray on our windows of our cars all through the winter. Various other things. Gum, that's where the sweets come in. Citric acid is lemon juice. Various other things that we use. An actual fact that Halliburton, I have no great time for Halliburton, they actually have a fracking fluid made only of food-grade chemicals now. 
But what is important is that you have that disclosed, that it is not kept secret. And full disclosure will be mandatory in the EU. It's taking place now in the US to some extent, but it's by no means uh, universal. Okay, I'm probably going to try to convince you that most of the issues, and this may not be helpful to you, most of the issues to do with shale gas are exactly the same issues that occur with conventional oil and gas. These are the environmental impacts of conventional oil and gas. Visual intrusion from oil rigs, noise, increased traffic, air pollution, water contamination, soil contamination, greenhouse gas emissions, and low magnitude earthquakes. All of those happen and will be happening here right, from conventional oil and gas. What makes shale gas different? Visual intrusion, noise, traffic and dust, the same. Gas frac fluids, I'll come to those in a minute. Well casing failure, gas contamination of aquifers, surface spills, release of greenhouse gases, low magnitude earthquakes. Not so very different in truth. So this is quite a nice uh, cartoon, not drawn by me, of the main issues which you could actually invoke. So we have fractures down at 3,000 to 4,000 feet. Can they actually transport fracking fluid into aquifers? Can that fluid mobilize other materials? That's important questions. But in actual fact, those are most of the issues which are to do with fracking. We have impact on water resources. We have fugitive emissions of methane. Inadequate transport of processing of produced gas inadequate treatment disposal of drill cuttings. Most of those, in fact I'd probably say all of those, are identical to issues which we face with conventional oil and gas production. I'm going to look at them in some detail now. Where do the fractures go? And how do we know? Well, this is a map of micro-seismic energy on the left from a several stage, I think it's about a seven stage frack. Those fractures are our friends. Those micro earthquakes are our friends. They tell us where the fracture goes. And this is an old colleague of mine, Sean Maxwell, on the right here. It shows the fractures go up to about 350 metres and down to about 200 metres. When you look at the bottom left, this is a map of where fractures go with respect to the aquifers. Aquifers are charged from the surface. What you do at the surface is important for an aquifer mostly. That's where you input pollution. These fractures, this is the Barnard Shale, none of them come anywhere near the aquifer. And another colleague of mine, Richard Davis, has produced a statistical plot. Only 1% of any fractures go greater than 350 metres, and something like a tenth of a percent can go as far as 600 metres. So we've actually stipulated you cannot carry out fracking within 600 metres of an aquifer as a respect distance. Water usage, okay? It depends where you are. In the UK, an individual frack stage uses as much water as irrigating a large field. Here, an analogy might be as watering a golf course in Alain, okay? In fact, in the US, the total water use is never more than 1%. This is the Barnett, Fayetteville, Hainesville, Marcellus. That may be a much more critical point here. Water is different. In a lot of the world, though, we get that perspective. Watering a golf course, okay, is the same as a frack, which is most important. We've seen some cartoons about shale gas and aquifers here. This is absolute nonsense. Historical documentation suggests the presence of methane gases in the shallow subsurface has been observed for over 200 years in Susquehanna County, long before the 2006 start of fracking. There are several, do several dozen instances of flammable effervescent springs dating back to the late 1700s. The water wells go through coal measures. Okay? You have always been able to light the water in Pennsylvania, regardless of what Josh Fox says. Now, this is interesting work because it shows the presence of methane in water as distance from gas wells. This appears to be the case. This is not associated with fracking. This is associated with poor well completion. This is a study which came out in May this year. 
1,700 groundwater analyses showed that methane is common in the water, but the chemistry shows that it is not from the Marcellus shale. It is from the middle and upper Devonian gases above the Marcellus. This is not fracking related. It is po possible it is travelling up the annulus, but this is not fracking related. The next thing is air emissions. How am I doing? Okay. Okay. Air emissions from fracking. These are two studies which have been done by uh, the chief scientist of the Department of Energy and Climate Change in the UK, David Mackay, and the second one done by the Australian um, College of Learned Associations. And it compares on the left hydro, which is the lowest emission of all, nuclear next, wind, solar, solar PV, conventional gas, and shale gas are much the same. Coal is very variable, but is a, probably twice as emitting as either shale gas or conventional gas, and there is very little to choose between them in the emission of methane to the atmosphere. Now, what I said before is true. What is important is your housekeeping, what you do at the surface. Surface spills of flowback water are much more likely to get into your aquifer than fracking water, which is at 10,000 feet. It's important, perhaps one of the most serious risks, but in actual fact, I do believe we have the engineering capability to deal with this. I hope we have. In the UK, we're very concerned about visual intrusion. We're a small country, lots of people. This is Dimmick, Pennsylvania, spelt wrongly, sorry, where you have fracking pads all over the shop. Now, that's because in the States, the only way to make money out of fracking is to let them frack on your land because you own those resources. That's not true in the UK. The meek shall inherit the earth, but not the mineral resources. The government owns those, so we will not have that. We will have multiple wells from single pads, probably 20 wells from each pad. And we know about this. This is the Dorset coast, a beautiful area, Corfe Castle, a World Heritage Site, two nature reserves. It's also where Witch Farm is, the largest European onshore oil field, which extracts oil from multiple, multiple well pad, 10 kilometers out into uh, the, the, Br the British Channel. Most people don't even know it's there. That's Cove Castle, right? You sail past that when you go on the ferry from, Dorset, from Poole to Cherbourg, right? We actually have the largest onshore oil field in Europe. You can see, you can see Cove Castle from it. Now, my own particular specialty is induced seismicity. Because <clears throat> we started exploring from shale gas in 2011, when a company called Quadrilla came to look at this particular basin called the Boland Basin. Now, the Boland Basin has probably at least 1,000 metres of shale, which is three times as thick as the Marcellus. They started fracking, and on April the 1st, which to us is called April Fool's Day, I got a call to say there'd been a 2.3 earthquake. And later on, we had a 1.5 magnitude earthquake. In total, we had 55 small earthquakes, which you can see on this bottom left here, correlated with the fracking stages. Uh, I installed seismometers. I told them to do this before, but they didn't take any notice. And we determined that the earthquakes were coming from very close to the fracking site. And Quadrilla admitted that. But a 2.3 earthquake um, in the UK might be an issue. I work with the Italians, and they laugh at me when they say that we are concerned about a 2.3 earthquake. And in actual fact, this is a synthesis of all of the fracking operations in the Barnet. Most seismicity from fracking is less than magnitude 0.5. Now, you do not feel 0.5. In most parts of the world, the background noise is even too small to detect it on seismometers. So we had this particular earthquake, which is 2.3, because they injected fluid directly into a fault. And that's what you must not do. And we have set a threshold at 0.5. This is what I have recommended to the government. This is their plot of what I suggested. It's not exactly right. But effectively, if you have seismicity less than zero, you carry on. Between 0 to 0.5, you start getting interested. 
At 0.5, you take some remedial action. Now, this top plot shows you where these lie on the great plot of earthquakes. They are extremely tiny. But what you must not do is inject large volumes of wastewater into the ground over long periods of time. This has now conclusively been shown in the US to produce earthquakes, sometimes 10 years after injection starts, but with magnitudes which might be magnitude 5. And my little bit of PowerPoint, you will create earthquake waves. So please do not do that. We've had, two, we've had a very big study in the UK by the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering on shale gas, with respect to the UK, albeit which concluded the health, safety, and environmental risks can be managed effectively in the UK. Fracture propagation is an unlikely cause of contamination, and the risk of fractures propagating to reach aquifers is extremely low. Well integrity is the highest priority. Your well completion is the important thing. Um, the Australian College Council of Learned Academies has done the same and just reported in May. The evidence suggests to provide appropriate monitoring programs are undertaken, and transparent regulatory regime put in place, there is a low risk that shale gas production will result in contamination of aquifers, surface waters, or the air, or that damaging induced seismicity will occur. But what you need is to monitor before, during, and afterwards. If you don't know what happened before, then anything happens will be blamed on you. So you must monitor methane in the air and groundwater, you must look at ambient seismicity, and you must demonstrate that conditions have not changed from that baseline. And what is really important in the States is that, uh, that they put into place what are called green completions, which means you do not flare gas. Flaring gas is stupid. You're burning money. And so that gas, which is captured with the flow back water, can be separated, and uh, that is making a very big difference to emissions. Now, the great climate implications are based on that. Um, the greenhouse, this is, this is the US um, National Academy of Sciences report of May. The greenhouse gas emissions of natural gas has fallen, and further efficiency could further this trend. And shale gas has led to decreased greenhouse emissions. Okay? So natural gas abundance will not have a substantial effect on future greenhouse gas. Policy is the key factor. And I will point out that despite not signing up to Kyoto and, in, and getting a tremendous amount of criticism for that, the, the, the greenhouse gas footprint of the US has fallen by 17% since 2009. It is the only large industrial nation which has reduced its carbon footprint. That doesn't mean it hasn't shipped coal to everywhere else for them to increase theirs, but it does give you a message that replacing coal by shale gas, particularly for us, let's say, you don't have coal, so it's not so much, is a very important thing. And I draw this diagram because this is what I call the triangle of truth for shale gas. And I tell the students this. The left-hand corner is technically feasible. Can we do it? And that varies, again, from place to place, but generally the answer is yes. The right-hand corner is economically deliverable. Can you do it and make money? Now, I say I'm not an economist. If you like, the market will take care of that itself. If you can't make money, you won't do it. If you can make money, you will. But the bottom one, in the UK particularly, is the most difficult, societally acceptable. Will anybody let you? And that anybody can be government, it can be regulators, and in our case, it's citizens. Citizens in the UK, they like to turn on the gas and like their cooker, they like to, like to switch, on, uh, switch and see electricity, as you do here. Somebody somewhere at the end of that wire or at the end of that pipe is accepting the environmental consequences for that. It is not ethically acceptable to ask someone else to bear the environmental cost of your generation. So I'll leave that message with you. Because the only source of, of energy we appear to like in the UK is to sit next to a roaring log fire on a cold winter's night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Stiles. I think I, I know how to make earthquakes in an easy way now. Uh, 
on the implications on the uh, global energy mix, I would like to call His Excellency Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. Uh, His Excellency joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1974, four years after I was born. He served as Indian Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE, and he was uh, also Additional Secretary for International Cooperation in the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. His Excellency was posted to a number of West Asian countries, including Kuwait, Iraq, Yemen, and uh, later as Council General, uh, General in Jeddah. He also held positions in the Indian missions to New York, London, and Pretoria. Uh, in July 2011, the Saudi government confirmed on him the King Abdulaziz Medal First Class for his contribution to the promotion of Indo-Saudi relations. Since retirement from foreign service, he has worked with an energy, an energy company in Dubai. Uh, His Excellency is going to talk about the global uh, changes in scenarios due to technological uh, developments on one side, as well as increasing political and community concerns on the other side. Welcome to the floor. The great advantage of being the last speaker is that you have absolutely nothing original to say. It is a challenge for me to hold your attention and I will summarize what the previous people have said and attempt to hold your interest for a while. If I find that the interest is flagging, I will rapidly terminate my, my, my remarks and we will move to lunch. When do you... Uh, excuse me, sir. It's not. I need to go. Make it go forward. When the United States emerged as a nation for the first time, its origins lay in the Declaration of Independence, and since those days, over 200 years later, this 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 desire to be independent, or more frequently, free is a recurring American emotion. And it's not astonishing that it should find its space even within energy. The horror upon horrors was in the early 1970s when the Americans had to face the Arab oil embargo and for the first time in several decades found that they were crucially dependent on the Middle East, on the Arabs for their economic sustenance. And then a second horror hit them. Another major energy producing country, which had been an ally for several decades, suddenly had, an, had a revolution. And suddenly you found yourself on the wrong side as far as the Middle East is concerned. And that is when you started looking at energy independence as your most important factor. And it has been a recurring theme continuously over every decade. Successive US presidents have declared from the podium their commitment to energy independence. There have been some good things that have come out of it as well. The United States, of course, remains extremely dependent on energy from external sources, particularly from Middle East and from various other somewhat unseemly nations. But then they have also become fuel efficient at home. They have become much more sensitive about pollution and environment matters. But from time to time, something goes badly wrong. In a time of grave national crisis, you think of energy independence once again. And then you look for this magic wand that will transform this scenario for the American people and make them free once again. There was this magic wand, some of you will recall, of biofuels 10 years, 15 years ago. It was that magic thing that would completely reduce your dependence on the Middle East and make you free. And then there was nuclear energy, and that was the second magic wand. Today, none of us discusses either of those seriously. But then there is the shale revolution. A new magic wand has emerged in the global energy scenario. It will free the American people from dependence on the Middle East. And if you were to go to the website, and say shale revolution plus OPEC, 
you get these headlines. OPEC fracked. The demise of OPEC. The demise of Saudi Arabia. A kind of enthusiasm, a kind of gloating that we will once again be free from these people. And this is all based on unconventional fuels. More distinguished people before me have already talked about it. I won't belabor the point and we'll move forward. In my paper, which will be finalized very shortly, these are the unconventional fuels I have looked at, but they are not statistically significant except for shale oil and gas and oil sands from Canada. The others are at a fairly nascent stage and are not likely to make a significant contribution to the global energy mix in the period we are looking at, that's 2035. Also, these figures have been seen by you. There is a significant change as far as the United States is concerned. They are producing a lot more oil than before. They are not self-sufficient as yet, but there are projections in that regard so that at some stage they could become self-sufficient. There has been a significant reduction in oil imports as these figures would show. And of course, there has been a very positive impact on the trade deficit as well. These are some figures. Now, I must straight away share with you a concern. If you think that economists disagree with each other on every aspect of the world and national economy, you haven't seen the geologists and the geoscientists. It is very difficult to get two papers on the subject of shale revolution where the scientists agree with each other. And, if, and we who have studied history and political science are completely bewildered. We have no idea who to quote, what kind of importance to give to a certain scholar and leave out somebody else because there is a huge quantum of literature that is available to us today but there is no agreement among them. Therefore, I hesitate when I look at any figures, I give a reference immediately at the back and say, I'm not responsible, this is the guy who said that. This is also true of projections. I have hardly seen two figures agreeing with each other. And then horror upon horror, the same institution changes its projections a year later. What are we to do? We are mere mortals, but that is where it is. With this caution, I am giving some figures here which indicate that the United States is likely to improve its scenario as far as imports are concerned of oil, but it is a dismal scenario again. Because the EIA says that even in 2035, they're going to be importing 36% of their oil. And another scholar, Mamdu Salame, says, no, they're not going to be importing 36%, they're going to be importing 68%. Because they have not looked at the depletion of their conventional resources. Anyway, so be it, they're going to be an import-dependent nation for several decades to come. Now, again, as a non-geoscientist, I have looked at these extremely turgid, extremely complex sources of information, and it's a bewildering, mind-blowing experience to go through this. But then I saw that there are these, very few people talk about, I think now it's becoming more common, I have seen the literature over the last two years that was started with extremely gung-ho enthusiasm in 2011. Now it is a little bit of sobriety coming. And even in the mainstream media, you find that I think there has been a bit of a hype. Let's get a reality check. And this is because of what I have just shown you, massive declines and rapid declines in production over a period of time. And this is, again, you have the complexities of, uh, of shale fields. They are, they are not uniform, the shale wells are different. There is one well extremely rich and the other extremely poor. People have lost a lot of money, uh, you know, and uh, even international oil companies like Shell, who have a lot of money to throw around, have closed some of their operations because they, it, they were losing propositions. Also, the range of expectations with regard to the future are very varied. Even a company like BP places itself somewhere in this scenario and says that, look, there's a whole range of things that might happen in future. And then they are all, we are all agreed on this. There is a consensus. It's extremely difficult to predict where, what the scenario will be with regard to unconventional fuels in the years to come. Of course, we have seen a very detailed presentation on pollution and climate change. This is a very powerful statement. It will go down extremely well with the people who have shale wells next to their home. 
and there will be a great enthusiasm to support this uh, this magical revolution in their neighborhood. But somehow the people, you know, they are a little cussed. They are not always convinced by the brilliance of our geoscientists. And there seems to be a certain degree of skepticism. The debate is still out there. I have read the literature and everywhere it is said, and it has been reflected in some of the remarks already, that the science is still at a nascent stage. We still have to do a lot of work. You can pick up a certain report and you find the contradiction available on the internet immediately. You pick up the third report and you find the contradiction available immediately. And then it gets more and more complex and more and more detailed. But the fact remains that these are certain extremely widespread and very popular concerns with regard to the shale revolution. Shale revolution, uh, the shale is available potentially all across the world, uh, of course in the United States. But then, even as you think of your great emerging rival in the East, China, China has a lot more than, you, than the United States. But having said this, China seems to be having a lot of difficulty in developing its resources and it's going to take a lot more time than we imagine. So let us look at some of the things that have happened. The first is Canada. You know, what was supposed to be a national freedom struggle suddenly became North American. Because, well, North American, they are much better than the Middle East anyway. No, no, no harm in depending on the Canadian. They are people like us, very different from the others whom we have depended on all these decades. The Canadian, so it became a North American freedom struggle where you had all these tar sands coming into the United States, America and Canadian gas, and those people were happily developing their fields until the U.S. president said no to the Keystone Pipeline. And then the reality struck the Canadians that they are not brothers under the skin at all. They're two completely sovereign nations with their own interests. And for the first time, the Canadians started thinking of marketing their product, both oil and gas, in Asia. So this North American affiliation got broken immediately. And today, a lot of money is going, both Canadian money and Asian money, is going into developing the various facilities, the logistics of transporting Canadian oil and gas to the Asian markets in the Asia Pacific. The European Union is, as usual, extremely intellectual, very thoughtful, has a numerous reports. If we ever make the mistake of wanting to know what the EU thinks on the shale revolution, you will have thousands of pages of reports produced by almost every institution in the, in the European Union, whether it's the European Parliament, the European Commission, European Union, and then the House of Commons has produced several thousand pages on this subject. And yet the people are uneasy. You don't find them completely thrilled about fracking as the geoscientist presented to us. And what are they really left with then? Cheap American gas at home and cheap American coal reaching the European Union. So that today the Europeans who were going, who are extremely sensitive about carbon, are actually importing more and more coal for their power. So in the short term, you're seeing a lot more use of American coal in the European Union than you did earlier. And therefore, the Americans, the Europeans are, have become extremely disturbed. And once again, what happened to the Western Alliance? The Europeans are now telling their government that because of cheap gas in the United States, the American industry is going to go through a renaissance at our expense. And we have ruined ourselves because we have been subsidizing renewables for all these years. And now you should cut those subsidies and pass on some of the advantages to the shale revolution. It's not happening just yet, but it could. In the meantime, due to sensitivities relating to carbonization, the European Union is likely to import more and more gas. Possibly at some stage it may get LNG from the United States, but in the medium term, till the medium term, 2020, 2025, it's going to be Russian gas, as it has been for all these decades. Asia. Not much is happening in Asia to change the scenario. All of us have little excited about this technological innovation that has emerged. We are putting some money in it. We are doing pilot projects. In India, we have, uh, we have taken up some pilot projects, trying to put our, our legislation uh, down, writing it down, see what we can do. We, need, we have a big problem about water. China also is, has put a lot more money than us, and, but they are dissatisfied with what has emerged. Overall scenario, as it was before, and this is where we are. 
Not how much has changed? Nothing. The scenario between now and 2035 for the world in, as a whole, I don't see any figures that have changed so dramatically. So the revolution is not having any reverberations at all till 2035 as far as the global scene is concerned. There are some changes. I don't need to belabor those. They are there. There will be a little more use of gas, little more use of renewables. But I just like to, because I'm mischievous, I want you to take a look at the figures relating to biofuels and nuclear energy. And what happened to those magic wands that President Bush told us about just a few years ago? There is going to be a lot more consumption of fossil fuels in, uh, in absolute terms. And therefore, the future scenario is conventional fuels. And where do conventional fuels come from? They come from the Middle East. In the meantime, yes, in Asia, we are going to look at nuclear energy. I think that's not a bad thing. A few years ago, I used to oppose it. I opposed it because I did not see it as a magic wand. It is not a magic wand. But I do believe that with, we must continue to focus on it. It's not going to take over our energy mix, but it's no harm in looking at it. There's an intense debate going on in Japan as well as to whether what to do with all the facilities they have set up, because they're feeling the pinch with regard to the shift towards renewables and the shift towards gas that they have already gone in for. And there are people who have said we are spending $125 million per day extra because we are not using our nuclear energy. So you will see India is also among those countries. China is, of course, in the lead where there's going to be major development in the nuclear sector. But this is an important slide for us. Look at the change. Whatever, even if the Americans to some extent reduce their imports from the Arab world, and in any case it's not particularly significant, it's not overwhelming in numbers, they get something from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has its own refineries in the United States, so there will be some import of Middle East oil. But really speaking, Middle East is, oil is going to shift to Asia. It's already shifted a lot. We are getting 60% of Middle East, of Gulf production, is going to Asia is going to become even more as the decades go. And our entire future is dependent on this conventional fuel from the Middle East. And the figures are as much as 90% of Middle East production is going to go to Asia. So where does it leave all of us? Was it a revolution? There's a question mark in the title of this conference. I think the question, we can put one more question mark. <laughs> and raise some doubts about this revolution. It is global energy demand will continue, demand of conventional fuels will continue, US production will significantly increase, but it will be insignificant compared to the global scenario, and United States will continue to be a major importer of global oil, at least to the extent of uh, 35 to 40 percent, if not more. Shale production globally is insignificant compared to the global demand for oil, which is overwhelmingly conventional. Who is then going to be at the heart of the energy scenario? It's going to be OPEC. OPEC is the one that is going to develop its potential capacity because it has to cater to this massive increases in demand in the rest of the world, whether it is the European Union or whether it is Asia. It's going to cater to those demands. This is putting in a lot of money already. So that you are already reaching a situation that by 2035, you more or less know what will be available from OPEC. Therefore, John Mitchell has said that the scenario has actually gone through a change, that you basically have no idea what is going to be the unconventional production, but you have a pretty good idea of what is going to be the conventional production. And in this conventional production, you're going to have Saudi Arabia at the heart of it. Saudi production will continue to be central to the global scenario, to the global energy scenario. Yes, there are concerns about increasing domestic production. It may come down. There will be, therefore, I would conclude that there is an interplay. We are at the cusp of change. There is a change. It is experienced. It's at an early stage, may not have a tremendous impact by 2035. But the fact remains that oil will remain a major, oil and fossil fuels and jet will remain the major part of the global energy mix. There are many intangibles. 
both on the demand side and the supply side. The only intangible I should put on the supply side is Iran. When I prepared this, this, kind, this new burgeoning rapprochement between the United States and Iran had not happened. So all the literature till that date did not take Iran into account at all and always focused on the Iraqis. Iraq has of course published its National Integrated Energy Strategy document and has posed very significant increases in the near future. But the, there are just so many intangibles, global economic growth, the, product, the demand from the major Asian countries, is that sustainable uh, given the situation they have at home? What about supply side? Will they be able to meet all the demand uh, uh, which will emerge? And therefore, what are we left with? For the United States, it has been a very welcome change. It has made them feel good about themselves. It has, it has encouraged a fresh look at their global scenario. They can perhaps go with greater enthusiasm to the Asia-Pacific and leave the Middle East to its fate, hopefully. It can only get better because of that. For the rest of the world, a new technology has certainly emerged, but it has still to make its, itself felt. And therefore, we come to geopolitics. The significant point to be noted, ladies and gentlemen, is that Asia is crucially dependent on Gulf production. We have no sustainable future except through the symbiotic relationship that has already emerged and which is likely to become even more consolidated as we go along over the next few decades. In this situation, can we have no role whatsoever in regard to the security and stability of this region? Can we be bystanders and passengers as we have been? Can we continue to permit the single superpower, the hegemon, to persist in maintaining security on the basis of military power and hegemonic interventions? The answer is no. The new idea that has a very strong resonance today in objective reality, the bulk of, Asia, of Middle East production goes to Asia. Every major Asian country today gets the bulk of its energy requirements from the Gulf. In the case of India, our imports are going to be over 90%. Overwhelmingly, this will come from the Gulf. In the case of Japan and Republic of Korea, 100% will come from this region. Even if you look at gas, it is going to come from this region. Then again, you look at the present day reality. The GCC is India's number one trade partner. The UAE is India's number one trade partner country-wise. The UAE is also India's number one trade destination. Japan, Republic of Korea and China are executing multi-billion dollars projects over here today. India has a community of six and a half million people in the GCC who send back home over 30 billion dollars as remittances. What more do we want? Our future is linked with this region and therefore I propose this is the subject of a paper that I have written recently, but I will only hint at it over here. A consensual, cooperative security arrangement that involves all the principal role players having an interest in Gulf security and the, all, and the four principal Asian players, China, Japan, Republic of Korea and India, promoting initially through a track two process and later track one promoting a new scenario that will emerge and I have given a quotation from my former minister that if there is to be an Asian resurgence in the 21st century and if the 21st century has to be an Asian century it will be founded on the common connectivity we have with regard to energy security. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for uh, the excitement you created and for pouring cold water on, on those excited people about the shale revolution at the end of this conference. Um, I would like to thank our uh, panelists. Uh, before that, I would like to open the floor for uh, discussion. Uh, if you have any final questions, um, I would like to take any questions you, you might have uh, collectively and then we answer them collectively by our panelists. We will start, uh, yes, on this fourth row, please. 
Yes. Uh, Jameed Mohammed, uh, just, the, just one point I'd like to make uh, in relation to the last speaker uh, about security. Uh, the Americans want to have a security pact and do have a lot in the Middle East here. NATO does, Britain does, now the Asian do, do. Is it to do with security? Again, and the question is against whom? Or is it to do with control? Thank you very much. Okay. Second question, please. Thank you very much indeed for your excellent contribution. Uh, my question in geopolitical terms, actually, I wanted to, my name is Ahmed Shikara, an ECSSR mm -hmm. uh, researcher. Uh, is related to probably the last uh, lecture of the excellent lecture of uh, Ambassador, uh, His, His Excellency uh, Tulmiz Ahmed. Uh, how do you foresee the repercussions of Arab Spring, because I, I, I been, you know, have been you know, uh, hearing and uh, studying and uh, watching uh, different scenarios. And different studies give different opinion on this. Some of them are positive, others are negative. And uh, according to the negative implications of Arab Spring, the US position has been retracting from the Middle East, according to some analysts. And Obama's getting advices from think tank bodies that he should concentrate more on China and on the East Asian countries, rather than on the Middle East, at least in percentages terms. Yani. So, but your, your lecture is very fundamental, is that the GCC is a pivotal of energy uh, supplies and energy production and also the futuristic scenarios of Iraq and Iran. Do I, I question Iraqi situation and many people question the production terms uh, and percentages, particularly uh, due to a number of uh, reasons, whether technical or political. My question is like this, are you sure that the US will continue its strategy in the medium term or in the immediate term or the uh, futuristic term to concentrate on the GCC uh, and uh, on all of these countries in the GCC or it has to uh, visualize a new direction due to the shale oil production and the importance of the scenario of the shale oil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Third question. Yes, please. Yes. Um, I don't mind uh, getting cold water while we are making millions of dollars and creating thousands of jobs and creating economic growth and supporting the state coffers and the economic growth of the United States. So I welcome that cold water. Um, I just would like to clarify one point on decline rates because the uh, charts being presented today several times. Just think about it this way. 20% of 10, the remaining is eight. 85% 8. of 100, the remaining is 15, which is almost double that eight. So when we talk about decline rates, let's remember it comes out of the initial, initial production, which is the IP, which is in some cases 20 times 20 times the initial production in conventional wells in the United States. So we're talking from very high number. When you take very high decline rate, 85%, we still, the remaining is way higher than the conventional in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Any f other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I will start with the uh, uh, Dr. O'Sullivan for his uh, perhaps reflections on the questions and on what has been said yeah, thank in you. the presentations. So um, the geopolitics are, are certainly not within my wheelhouse, uh, that's for the ambassador. Um, but uh, I, I just have to agree with the, the final point that was just made there. I mean, look. Uh, there are uh, there are two sides. Uh, there are certainly challenges with the uh, with the shale dynamic, but in terms of its impact on uh, on the U.S. system, it has been tremendous. And uh, and the resource uh, people need to realize is really in its nascency. And uh, as with conventional resources, uh, technology development will drive uh, will drive. Uh, improved performance over the coming years and decades. That's unquestionable. Um, today though, even, uh, even, even with wells that have relatively high decline rates, or decline rates, what we have seen is a reduction in the level of decline rate year to year owing to, um, 
owing to insight that's emerging in terms of how to better manage these wells. The other point is that on average, as was just stated, uh, shale wells are much more productive than uh, conventional wells in the US context. So we are able to bring much more product online faster than was previously possible. Um, ultimately though, if you look at the overall scale of global energy demand and what is likely to be possible, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, you know, a global revolution from shale might be might be stretching it. But it's it's I I think uh, it is also fair to say that within the context of the the U.S. energy system, the impacts have been have been relatively revolutionary, particularly considering the context where we we're coming from about ten years ago. Thank you, Professor Stiles. Okay, well, I can't really comment on the issues to do with Asia, but. Uh, I do have a fairly clear, clear view of Europe. Um, there are a whole lot of issues. European gas, a lot of it is sourced from the Russian stockman fields. If we're looking at environment, the average leakage rate from pipelines from the Soviet Union is 1.5%. Over a 20-year time scale, and to be fair, I only think I've got another 20 years left in me. So. Um, that's all I worry about, particularly. Methane is 75 times worse than CO2. 75 times 1.5 is 120%. Bringing gas from Siberia to most of Europe has a higher carbon footprint than burning it at the end. That is not an efficient way to protect the environment. Secondly, um, we... We have built liquefied natural gas import terminals in the UK. And I don't know why, because we have only managed to import two tanker loads of LNG into the UK in the last year. Because Japan will pay four times as much as we will. Okay. So that is, that is an issue, the economics of gas. And when we get it to the UK, we have virtually no storage. We have a tenth of the storage that Germany or France has. So believe me, there are issues to do with supply and security in the UK particularly, but also in the rest of Europe. And the environmental aspects of transporting gas through very poor pipelines from Soviet Union should not be underestimated. That is where the threat of methane to the environment comes, not from fracking. Thank you, Professor Stiles. Your Excellency. The world as we knew it is going through very significant changes. The first change that came upon us was the emergence of Asia, economic emergence of Asia. This was, if you want to put a date, it would be roughly around the year 2000, where you suddenly noticed that China and India are showing high growth rates and are major consumers of energy resources. And this changed the world view, and suddenly we started talking about the Asian resurgence. And then there were larger works which said, but Asia used to be the principal role player in global economy till 200 years ago, till the advent of imperialism. What we are simply doing is recovering our place in the global scenario, doing away with the implications of the Arabs, uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the imperialist order. The imperialist order never went away after the Second World War. Many of us who became free from 1947 onwards when India became free, we were still in a world order that was inequitous. It was still dominated by the West. For the first time in the beginning of this century, you sensed that there could be a change. We have a very, very long way to go because Asia has no habit of cooperation. The, uh, somebody asked me in a conference, when was the first time you felt Asian? We felt Asian when the Japanese defeated Russia in 1905. There was a surge of joy all across the Asian world that yes, you could take on an imperialist power and defeat it. But then later on, uh, Japan's own imperialist thrust across Asia gave, uh, I mean, ensured that that thing died away. It came up again in the post-Second World War period, but then the Cold War 
began and you found that all this sense of Asia died and we were then divided and subdivided right across Asia. It's only in the year 2000 where we finally, 10 years after the end of the Cold War, that you found a new sense. There is a new order that is taking shape, very early stages. We have no sense. In the, new, in the order in which we are today, we have ancient grievances that are given a contemporary value. We have, for example, Sino-Japanese issues, uh, Korean-Japanese issues, Indo-Pak issues, Sino-Indian issues, and of course in the Arab world you know all the issues. So we have problems. So the first challenge is to build a certain consensus, a practice of dialogue among Asia. So this was the first change. Now in the, as the world changed, and it became democratic and popular participatory, one region of the world remained outside this change. And from Morocco up to Yemen, you found a political order that did not belong to the modern period, modern times. Each country has its own unique history and dynamics, but there was a sense that something is missing in this world. The people are extremely well educated. They are connected with each other due to technology and the internet. They are familiar with, they are part of the global economy. And yet there is something missing in the political arena. So the Arab Spring is the first significant challenge to the Arab status quo. In the immediate, it is very significant and its reverberations will dominate this region for a few decades to come. Now, we must not judge a major development on the basis of what happens in the immediate aftermath. If you did that, then you would have a very poor opinion about the French Revolution or any other revolution that happened. It is in the first few years of change, there is tremendous resistance from the forces of status quo who have everything to lose. But I don't think it is cast in stone. I think that there will be significant changes, perhaps uh, uh, you know, perhaps starting from the top rather than from the bottom. You don't need people on the streets for change. I am quite confident with my experience in this region that there is, for example, the Amir of Kuwait statement yesterday. He's demanding that his country change. Every leader that I have met and known has committed himself to change. It's not for us who are outsiders to tell them how, what kind of change they must have and what should be the speed and direction of that change. That is for them to sort out. But the Arab Spring is going to be the single most significant development in the Arab world for a few decades. And it will have reverberations in the years to come. This third change that is happening is more immediate it is the US-Iran dialogue. I'm not going to pretend to you that it's going to be a magic wand that within two years they will be the best of friends. The whole scenario was artificial. That you were, you were still grieving over the loss of your ally in 1979 and the humiliation and arrest of your diplomats. Move on, get on with it. Here is this huge chunk of territory of great geopolitical and energy significance and you pretend it doesn't exist. Iran is not Cuba. Iran is a significant role player in this region. So I think that there is something happening there. Will it happen easily? No. The powerful forces of resistance are there. They are there in the United States in the shape of the right-wing Republican right. They are, share, they are there in Israel uh, in the shape of the settler movement and the, and the right-wing movement represented by the Prime Minister. And it is there in the Arab world as well. So there are going to be, and there is a certain alliance that has emerged between some of these right-wing elements. So there will be tremendous resistance to change, but it is going to happen. My own suggestion to this region has been consistently that you must engage with Iran on your own. Don't worry about the Americans. Americans will look after America's interest. You have to look after your own. You have to be in engagement. And that, now the last point, there is no question of a new order in the region that is hegemonic. The word that I used is cooperative. Cooperative security arrangement. A cooperative security arrangement is part of international theory where you have the hegemonic arrangement, where you have a one military force which dominates the region. 
You have real politics where a sort of balance of power is maintained, and you have a cooperative security arrangement where all the principal role players get together and work together on the basis of consensually accepted norms and values. And I believe that GCC plus Iran plus, plus Iraq will constitute the core of this. There will be external role players who have a vested interest in the stability of this region, and the catalytic role will be played by China, Japan, Republic of Korea, and India. How do we go about it? Next steps, we are putting together a track to dialogue first between the Asian countries, so that we start discussing, not bilateral issues, but start discussing issues of great interest to us. So I, I am very optimistic that in a five to 10 year period, this is something that is doable. What about the United States? The United States approach is generally dominating hegemonic. The United States so far has never shown any capacity to work in a cooperative way with someone else. Because then you have to treat that partner as an equal, worthy of respect. That is not possible. You must have seen the way they treat their allies. It's, it's a very dangerous thing to be an American ally, because they treat you really badly. They treat their enemies better, more respect. So I think that the American now, this whole business of the Asia-Pacific pivot, if it is based on a cooperative arrangement of working with people rather than dominating them, it is something that you can look at constructively. But if it is a force that you shift your Navy and you shift your armed forces and place them in Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia and then tell the Chinese that we are going to encircle you and going to ensure that you don't get on and you don't go and change the world order, I think they are going to come to grief on that. I think that there is a new mindset emerging in the United States, it's not very powerful, it's not very resonant. The country is very, very deeply divided ideologically and has been for 10 years. The president's capacity to contribute and really make a difference is very limited, as you saw recently, but it is something worth pursuing in the years to come. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you for uh, giving this uh, overview of the uh, global uh, future prospects of the shale revolution as well as uh, benefiting from your great experience in the region. Uh, I would like also to uh, thank Professor Stiles for um, presenting this comprehensive analysis of the uh, uh, environmental impact uh, and comparing the environmental impact of conventional and non-conventional and conventional, uh, fuel, and Dr. O'Sullivan for presenting the challenges and the trends, especially focusing on the U.S. Uh, um, case. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your uh, for listening and for participating uh, slightly at the end with the, these three, four questions that we've got. Uh, hopefully, the session was uh, useful for you. Uh, and before we close, I would like to um, um, call Akh um, Ahmad Muhammad Al Astad uh, to present uh, a closing, his closing remarks in, uh, on behalf of His Excellency, the Director General of the Center. Dr. Jamal Sanad Swaidi. In the end of the conference, uh, final uh, closing remarks uh, uh, for Dr. Jamal Sanad Al Swaidi, Director General of the ECSSR, uh, delivered on his behalf, uh, Mr. Ahmad. Gracious, the most merciful, distinguished guests. Peace be upon you all. I'm so glad to closing the 19th uh, conference uh, of the ES, uh, ECSSR as researchers and speakers uh, to express our thanks uh, to His uh, Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, uh, President uh, of the UAE, uh, to sponsor this uh, conference and his uh, unlimited, uh, unlimited uh, uh, help and assistance uh, and uh, for the social development and human development and uh, 
knowledge based economy from and its vision for the emirates uh, for 2020 and um, and also uh, all uh, the support uh, of his uh, highness uh, mohammed bin zayed al nahyan president of the uae well ladies and gentlemen i I would like to express my thanks to you for your uh, scientific uh, knowledge and uh, with all your assistance uh, and uh, the all your visions for the geopolitical implications uh, on the energy side and its implication on the Gulf region uh, in general and the UAE in specifically and uh, for four sessions during the last two days we have seen uh, so many inputs uh, we would like to thank you uh, because uh, uh, we have seen uh, a lot uh, of light shed uh, on all the issues and i would like to express my thanks to those uh, speakers with their documents and papers and the hydrocarbon and its implication on the global uh, markets and the Gulf producers and the relation between Asia and Gulf region and whether in this time or in the future ladies and gentlemen all the recommendations by this conference will put us forward for to face any challenges and your recommendations will participate to set strategies for all the country institutions and our governance is not only related to our people but it's going out the it's going towards Arab region and Arab countries and the whole world. We are trying to continue what our ancestors tried before and we are trying to follow uh, the steps of His Highness uh, Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, President of the UAE. And I would like to thank with your name the sponsors of the conference and all the strategic partners to realize the goals of the conference. The Ministry of Interior, Masdar, Etihad Bank, National Bank, ADNOC, ATCO, the Environment Institution, the Higher Council for the Emergency and Management of Disasters, Gulf News. I wish you all a good stay in our beloved land in the UAE, and we'll see you again, and peace be upon you all.